Good evening, everybody. It's great to see everybody's faces this evening, a full room. It's uh, always good to see uh, uh, individuals uh, attending these board meetings and uh, you know, engaging uh, with us, and allowing us to, to, to make a very informed and uh, uh, decisions uh, we will with your input. So, so thank you for taking that time. That said, we are returning to our regular session And 15905D to review revision number one to the expenditure budget for fiscal year 2021. I need a motion, please. I'll move that we convene the public hearing. I'll second that. Uh, Ms. Concha, we have a motion by Ms. Stone uh, and a second by myself. Uh, board members. Uh, Ms. Contra, we may need a voice. No, You're good? Okay. Yep, you got it. Actually, we may need a voice vote anyway. Can you run us through a voice vote on that line item, please? Thank you. Yes, President Sandoval. Mrs. Pingarelli. Mr. Sandoval. Aye. Mrs. Stone. Aye. Mrs. Sejal Martinez. Aye. Mrs. Underhill. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. Ms. Myers, good evening. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Good evening, President Sandoval, members of the Governing Board, Dr. Reynolds, colleagues, and community. This evening, I will present information related to the first budget revision for fiscal year 2021 for the operating budget for the Peoria Unified School District. Tonight, I will review the requirements related to budget revisions, as well as highlight the main changes to the maintenance and operations district additional assistance and classroom site fund budgets. I will also provide comments on COVID-19 CARES Act grants that are also included in the budget. Stewardship of community resources is one of the four perspectives of the district's strategic plan. The annual budget process is part of the strategic perspective to solidify and adhere to effective policies, practices, and accountability for district resources. I would also like to thank our budget analyst, Veronica Fabella, for her assistance with the budget revision. A public school district must adopt an annual budget, uh, uh, an annual fiscal budget rather, each year by July 15th, and can revise the budget in December and May of the fiscal year. Peoria Unified is being required to revise our fiscal year 2021 budget this December due to a decrease in enrollment and associated reduction in funding. The uh, budget revision being presented tonight also allows the district to include prior year uh, carry forward balances to come into the new fiscal year and to be included into our, in our current year budget. Each year in July, Peoria Unified adopts an annual expenditure budget for maintenance and operations, also known as M&O. This fund is where most of the regular education and special education expenditures take place for the district as day-to-day -day activities that include salaries and employee benefits, supplies, utilities, transportation costs, and other operational expenditures not of a capital nature. In this budget revision, the M&O budget is being increased $12,944,157, which is a combination of an $11.5 million funding decrease due to COVID-19 student enrollment decreases, $23 million of the fiscal year 2020 M&O carry forward that was not reflected in the adopted budget, and a $1.4 million K-3 reading budget adjustment. Both the adopted and revised fiscal year 2021 M&O budgets include funding from the district's M&O override totaling $29 million. District additional assistance funds, also known as capital, include furniture and athletic equipment, textbooks, instructional aids, computers, software, and related expenditures. In this budget revision, the adopted district additional assistance budget is being increased $5,560,417 to recognize the fiscal year 2020 carry forward. 
that was not included in the fiscal year 2021 adopted budget for a revised budget amount of $21,245,674. The classroom site fund, as prescribed by Arizona Revised Statute 15977, was established in 2002 when Proposition 301 was passed. The fund accounts for a portion of the state sales tax collections and land trust revenues provided to school districts as an additional source of revenue and funding for teacher salary increases. The classroom site fund supports base pay and performance pay for certified classroom teachers. The budget in this fund is being increased to $24,828,132 to reflect prior year carry forward amounts that were not included in the fiscal year 2021 adopted budget. Federal CARES Act grant budgets have been revised to align to actual grant awards. Further budget alignments for all district, federal, and state grants and cash controlled funds will be made in May when the district does the second budget revision for the year. The district initially identified three COVID-19 related grants that became part of the fiscal year 2021 budget adoption process. ESSER, also known as the Elementary and Secondary School Education Emergency Relief Fund, will result in $4.2 million of funding for Peoria Unified as a reimbursable grant. The funding can be used for pandemic relief, preparation, prevention, and recovery, and will be fully expended this fiscal year. The Enrollment Stabilization Grant, also known as ESG, uh, was designed by the Governor's Office to provide school districts with a one-time formula award uh, for ESG based on the greater of 105% of the school's District 2021 40th day weighted average daily membership or 98% of the actual fiscal year 2020 weighted ADM. Peoria Unified qualified for the second criteria. $370 million of the governor's coronavirus relief funds were designated to support this stabilization program statewide. School districts applied for the grant and the total initial statewide award based on the original formula was calculated at $623 million, which was a $253 million difference from the available funding, so the need was higher than the funds that were available. Due to this, final district awards were proportionately reduced by the Governor's Office. For Peoria Unified, the district estimated an initial award of $14.5 million, and we actually recently received $11,431,732. So as you can see, our award was lower than what we projected we would qualify for. This reduced ESG award will require the district to absorb a greater portion of the fiscal year 2021 funding reduction due to pandemic-related enrollment decreases. The fiscal year 2021 May budget revision will also reflect the reduction in funding from 100% to 95% for virtual students a student attending virtually versus in person is funded at 95%. And we will recognize that impact with our May revision. A third grant the district applied for was AZ DEMA FEMA, and we've shared information with you regarding that opportunity earlier in the summer and as we moved into the budget adoption process. Unfortunately, as districts have worked uh, with the agency and criteria have been updated, all districts are seeing that uh, due to the criteria modifications, this AZ DEMA FEMA is a pass-through grant, a uh, federal grant to the state agency, School districts really don't have an opportunity to pursue this grant as a viable option. So we're, we've removed that from our budget revision. And finally, a fourth opportunity that's somewhat new, uh, recently announced was that $19 million of GEARS funds, and as you see, I have a graphic that kind of provides that at a glance, the funding that's being navigated, the GEARS funding that was recently announced from the governor's office and ADE to support an acceleration academy to help Arizona students who are most impacted by the pandemic. We are monitoring the requirements. We've received notification. We do plan to apply as eligible. There is a formula uh, aspect to the award. And once we uh, receive funding and, and know what that dollar amount is, we'll bring that forward to the governing board and we will include it in our May budget revision. 
Based on the information provided, administration recommends that the governing board approve budget revision number one for the fiscal year 2020-2021 uh, expenditure budget as presented during the action agenda item later in the governing board meeting. This concludes the presentation. At this time, the community can offer comments, and I am available to answer your questions from the governing board regarding the budget revision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Uh, we don't have any public comment tied to this line item, but uh, any questions, comments, Ms. Dunn? Uh, we don't have any tied to this. Thank you, Ms. Stone. Ms. Unreal? Just one question, and I'm sorry if I missed this on the slide. Um, so that ESSER dollars were actually what we anticipated, is that correct? Yes, okay. uh, ESSER actually was awarded based on Title, uh, title I uh, funding. So we received that dollar amount from the state. The ESSER grant award actually started in May of, uh, March rather, of 2020 and extends through September of 2021 so it actually bridges okay. more than one fiscal year we'll fully expend it this year we will receive the full allocation amount it is a reimbursement grant great thank you thank you for that miss pingarelli uh, no questions thank you thank you miss a martinez i have one question and one requ future request as uh, it aligns to the topic the first, um, similar to Ms. Underhill, thank you uh, for sharing the information we've been keeping an eye on on the funding. Uh, you mentioned that the original request was about $14.5 million and the shortfall was roughly around 11 point something million dollars. Is that accurate? Can President Sandoval, members of the governing board, Mrs. Seha Martinez, based on an estimator that was published uh, through the school finance community, ASBO, as well as the Auditor General's office, all school districts were able to estimate what they thought their award would be. As I mentioned earlier, there were two award criteria. We qualified for the second criteria of 98% of the fiscal year 2020 funding. And with that estimator, we projected we would be eligible for $14,553,503. Our actual award was eleven million four hundred thirty-one thousand seven hundred thirty-two. So the difference was actually three million one hundred twenty-one thousand seven hundred seventy-one dollars. So, in regards to the shortfall, I know we're very critical where every dollar is going. Do we have an idea of where that shortfall, what's going to be impacted in our planning for COVID? This is Seha Martinez, members of the governing board. We evaluate our, our COVID-related needs on a weekly basis. With this shortfall, it will be, uh, it will be funded from our carry forward from fiscal year 2020, but then that carry forward cannot be used for another need. Okay, thank you very much. And then my only request going forward as we take a look, it's good news that we hear the gears and the funding. One of our number one concerns, in addition to safety at these round tables that we've been having with parents is how are we addressing the academic shortfalls? Uh, so to hear that uh, $19 million potential uh, funding supporting student success, I would like to see what the plan is and per student spending on that $19 million will be um, when it comes forward to the board. President Sandoval, Mrs. Seha Martinez, members of the governing board, I should clarify that $19 million is statewide. That will not be Peoria Unified's Thank you. award. It, it could be very small in, in comparison. There'll be a formula aspect to um, the allocation of the monies and we'll keep the governing board abreast of what that looks like for Peoria Unified. Thank you, and so that makes um, a big difference. Uh, so whatever that dollar value is, I'd still like to articulate it per student spending and how we're determining where we're allocating those dollars based on need, most vulnerable students, uh, special ed. Thank you. Perfect, thank you for that, Ms. A. Martinez. Ms. Myers, thank you very much, appreciate it. Board members, I do need a uh, consideration to adjourn this public hearing. I move that we adjourn the public hearing. I need a second. I'll second. Okay. Ms. Contra, we have a motion by Ms. Underhill and a second by Ms. Doan. Board members, please cast your votes.
Motion passes, 5-0. Thank you, board members. Moving on to opening exercises, 6.1, moment of silence uh, and pledge of uh, allegiance. Ms. Stone, would you mind lead us, leading us in the pledge? And as we go through a moment of silence, we can continue to keep our teachers, students, families in our thoughts. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Stone. Okay, moving on to section seven, address the agenda. Does any board member have um, any considerations, adoptions, or recommended changes to the agenda? Ms. Dunn? No? Nope. Ms. Underhill? Ms. Pingrelli? Uh, yes. I would like to uh, move, uh, let's see, 12.2 uh, down to the bottom of the action items and move everything up. Okay, I'll second that. Ms. Contra, do you need a moment to, to make those changes? Yes, sir, thank you. President Sandoval, I have moved that item to the bottom of the action item. Board members, if you can refresh your screen, it should update for you. Might have to go back into meetings, though, if you do so. Okay, moving on to Section 8, Recognitions 8.1. Ms. Danielle Airy, welcome. Good evening, President Sandoval, members of the board, Dr. Reynolds, cabinet, and guests. It is no secret that governing board members spent countless hours volunteering their time, preparing for meetings, visiting school sites, speaking at events, advocating for students. The list really truly does go on and on of the work that you all do to support our schools, our students, our community. After tonight, we will bid farewell to two governing board members who have generously served the Peoria Unified School District community, Mrs. Seja Martinez and Ms. Doan. Ms. Seja Martinez has been a dedicated member of the Peoria Unified School District governing board since 2017, where she has positively impacted our district really in immeasurable ways. While she will no longer be serving on the board, we are so proud to have her spirit of service still alive and strong in this community uh, where her family resides uh, and her boys are attending one of our schools. Thank you, Mrs. Seja Martinez, for your service, for your passion, for all that you have brought to our community during your time and your service here. And I think one of your boys, or on behalf of your boys, there's something special for you this evening. I am sure they will be glad to have a little bit more of your time now that you, uh, your service has concluded. Ms. Doan has served on the governing board since 2015, and her passion for helping our children earn the best education possible and work towards strengthening our education system has not gone, gone unnoticed. It has been evident throughout her service, the time, the diligence that she has given, the feedback, the suggestions, and really the care she has put into uh, 
uh, her service here on the board. So we would like to thank you as well, Ms. Doan, for your service uh, to our district and to our community. I should also note that we are continuing to have you as a part of our Peoria Unified family and uh, have your granddaughter attending one of our schools as well. So we're so proud to have her uh, with us and to see her educational journey begin. Uh, on behalf of our school district, we just can't thank you enough for your service uh, and for all you have done to impact us in so many ways. Uh, but on behalf of our cabinet, Dr. Reynolds, we're not the only ones extending our thanks this evening. We actually have a special guest who was unable to join us, but is sharing a message of thanks as well. It is my honor and privilege to be here tonight to honor two colleagues that have become true friends, Judy Doan and Mrs. Monica Sejas Martinez. First, let me talk about Judy. There, there's an old time comic, Henny Youngman, I think he was, who tells a story about his daughter who had a new baby and she could not get the baby to stop crying. Daddy, daddy, I have been to everyone. I've been to the doctor, I've been to another doctor. I have watched TV shows and I have read books and I cannot get this baby to stop crying. And he looked at her, I think he tipped his glasses and said, my dear, I think it would be a good idea for you to put down the book and pick up the baby. That is, Judy Doan. She's been an example of somebody who's continually put down the book and picked up the baby. She's done it with um, our PUSD students. She's done that with her, her daughter and her son, her beautiful baby granddaughter, um, the kids that she teaches in Sunday school with her, her songs and her, her stories that she tells. She's done it when she's gotten ready for um, all of the things that she's worked on, whether it be special ed issues that are dear to her heart, uh, working on math and making sure that our kids have math, basic math skills, uh, working on um, things like like uh, our arts festival. She's enjoyed that tremendously and loves all of these celebrations that we do. And she's had, had a lot of work with our pre-kindergarten programs. So she is amazing. She's never had a crossword for anybody since I've known her. She's an expert at doing things in a positive way. So she is a real special, extraordinary person that I have enjoyed working with. Um, she's made the place a better place and our babies have been picked up because of her. Monica Sejas Martinez, I, talk, I happened to talk to her this afternoon, and she said she was so nervous about tonight that she didn't think she would be able to say or speak clearly or do anything. Really? That's never happened. <laughs> Years ago, my husband Lee published a book, and the book was called Deposition. He, we published it actually after he died, and I never saw the acknowledgement, but it said to my wife, Linda, who makes the impossible possible and the possible certain. I think that's a fitting description for Monica, more fitting than for me, whether it be financial literacy or diversity and inclusion, parental rights, student rights, all of the myriad of is issues that we've dealt with. Monica has absolutely done the, made the impossible possible and the possible certain, and she's done it through her vision and her tenacity and her critical and creative thinking and and her passion. Judy, Monica, to both of you, I can't imagine my tenure as a superintendent without your support and your kindness and your friendship. And that's similar to how I felt in the last several months since I've left. You have had unwavering support, showed me a lot of compassion and certainly very close friendship. Thank you for all you do and certainly congratulations. It is my honor and privilege to be here. 
So for those who may not recognize that face and voice, that is Mrs. Linda Pallas Thompson, former superintendent here in the Peoria Unified School District, who of course worked closely with Mrs. Seha Martinez, Ms. Doan, and all of us wanting to share her congratulations. Well, we do have uh, something to share with you, a, a little thank you on behalf of our school district, and I know Dr. Reynolds would like to present that to you, so I'll invite uh, Dr. Reynolds around to the front, and Ms. Doan, Mrs. Seha Martinez, if we could ask you to come around uh, to the front of the dais here as well, so we can present that to you uh, to commemorate your last official meeting here in the Peoria Unified School District. Uh, we just are so grateful and, and simply can't thank you enough for your service and for your leadership on our governing board. And after we make this presentation, we'll be sure to get a socially distanced photo here that we can share uh, to celebrate the both of you. <laughs> Thank you. You should grab your family. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I know we'll have some, some questions, maybe some comments uh, from the board for our outgoing members. Before we do, uh, President Sandoval, if you don't mind, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, as they are leaving their seats, uh, we know they are leaving them in good hands uh, with some new board members who will be joining us here in our school district. Uh, we have Mrs. Rebecca Hill, who will be taking one of those seats. She's joined us this evening, sitting right here up in front, as well as Dr. Bill Sorensen, who will be joining our board. So we'd like to thank the both of you uh, for, for joining our team here in Peoria. And I should mention President Sandoval will also be joining us for another four-year term. So we want to congratulate the three of you. President Sandoval. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Sari. We do have a public comment on this line item before we move forward, and that is with uh, Ms. Trina Berg. Thank you very much, President Sandoval, members of the board. Um, as president of the Peoria Education Association, I just want to thank you both for your service for these last few years on our board. Working with you has been a tremendous pleasure, and I do appreciate all that you have given to this board. And Ms. Seha Martinez, you're going to be missed. Thank you so much for your constant vigilance and just looking out for some members of our district who may not always feel like they are advocated for. I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much to both of you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Berg. All right. Well, we're going to stay on this line item for a little bit, and uh, I definitely want the uh, the board to comment and really congratulate uh, Ms. Sam Martinez and Ms. Stone and, and welcome the new board members. So, uh, so, Ms. Stone? She gets to go last, right? Okay. Perfect. <laughs> we could do that. That means, Ms. Pingarelli, you get to kick us off. Uh, well, uh, let's see. I'll start with uh, with Monica. I'm going to call first names on the last board meeting. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's been a uh, I guess I should say a long six years, short six years. Uh, uh, we've gone through a lot together. Um, one thing that uh, I've always admired about you is your um, you, you come prepared, overly prepared. Uh, you ask a lot of questions. I think our board's uh, meetings have been extended by quite a bit since you've been on the board. Um, 
uh, what else? You know, I just, uh, we are very different. Um, we vote differently. Uh, we probably will be voting differently this evening. But I highly respect you and uh, I appreciate your friendship. Thank you. Uh, Judy, um, you are uh, uh, very down to earth. You, you bring a, um, a balance to the board. Um, uh, I, I appreciate working with you for the last six years. Uh, one thing that uh, I, I don't know if a lot of people know that the board can't really talk to each other. We, we can only talk to one person on a particular topic. So we, we know each other, um, we work with each other, but we really don't, um, we're not as friendly as, as, as we would like. Um, so I know you said one thing in the past. Uh, you said when you get off the board, you'll be happy because now we can become friends. And, uh, and, and uh, I, I would like to, uh, to get together with you more and become a better friend. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pingerelli. Ms. Underhill? Okay. Well, I'll start with Judy, <laughs> since we went the other way first. Um, Judy, it's been a pleasure for me to get to know you the last couple of years as well. Um, I've always appreciated your dedication and your care for all of our children, especially those with special needs, and um, I've learned a lot from you from that perspective. Um, I also appreciate you always sharing your honest, down-to-earth perspective as well, so that's been a nice aspect of our board. Um, and I guess I just wish you now time to really enjoy your, your little one, <laughs> and instead of just having to like you know make decisions about education, being able to participate and, and go enjoy that beautiful center that she's attending and those kinds of things. So best wishes for a wonderful next chapter. <laughs> and then Monica, um, again, it's been wonderful serving with you the last couple years. You kind of, you know, always were able to answer my questions, very welcoming and welcoming to the board. Um, there's a lot to say. You have, you know, a lot of intelligence and knowledge and a quest for that, continued, you know, acquiring of that. Um, you have an awesome fighting spirit for our community. Um, you know, you're definitely dedicated to all of our students and our families here in this community. Um, you push us to always do better, to work toward more accountability, and you should just know that you are admired and appreciated, and, and I'm grateful for your service, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. Ms. Sam Martinez, um, it's been a long four years. <laughs> really long. No, I'm kidding. Um, look, uh, gosh, you know, I, uh, I got to first meet you, right, when uh, we ran in 16. And, um, you know, while we were both running, you know, for um, you know, one of three seats uh, and obviously could, yes, could be seen as, you know, competitors. What I've enjoyed over these last four years um, is getting to know you better, um, growing our, our really what, growing a friendship, um, you know, that uh, really stemmed from, you know, again, you know, sitting on this board. Um, you know, what I'm about to say, and I say it with a hundred uh, nothing but respect. You have grown a ton, you know, over these four years, and uh, you know your your passion and really courage, uh, you know, to being willing to roll up your sleeves, get in the ring, uh, you know, take you know what uh, what comes at you, really putting yourselves in a vulnerable position for the. Uh, the greater good of this district and our community and, and more most importantly you know our youth uh, it's just uh, those leadership qualities um, you know are you don't see in, in, in everybody and um, you know this district uh, I believe you know uh, over these last four years um, you know when we talk about you know this board having 
different lenses, right, to look at things a little bit differently to help the district grow. I believe that your lens really drove the district to think in a different way um, across uh, many different categories. Um, you know, uh, Ms. Pallas Thompson talked about a few of them, right, from financial literacy to DNI to um, from a special needs perspective, um, and uh, and and then you know taking your 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 experience as a teacher uh, and and really sitting in those shoes, and, and that's one of the things that I really appreciate about you that you took the time to listen, but more importantly, uh, took the time to being willing to stand in another shoe, pair of shoes to to really get to to know them in a, a more a deeper way to be able to make informed decisions. So it's it's been an honor. To serve on this board with you and uh, <laughs> I know this isn't going to be the the end of hearing your voice uh, in this district so it, you know we'll, we'll continue to um, you know interact with you I'm sure um, move it forward so but um, but again um, just just thank you for, for being you and Miss Doan my uh, deus partner <laughs> um, I, I think what's been said you're uh, your commitment to um, really all of our youth uh, and bring in that lens, uh, to, you know, when it comes to our students with special needs. Um, you know, our, our mantra is every student every day. And, um, you know, certainly those students, um, um, you know, are, are part of our, our village, if you will. And, um, you know, it's, uh, and you never wavered, you know, from making sure that, um, you know, that discussion was always at the table you know, in every decision that we made. Um, I, I do appreciate um, the ability to, uh, Ms. Pingarelli brought up, you know, our inability as a board to really interact, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, outside of these meetings. That said, um, what I really enjoy about you is the, the respect that you have always given, not just me, but other board members. Um, regardless of how we, you know, voted, whether it was the same or, or, or really differently, um, it was always done in a way that um, uh, was respectful, uh, and uh, you know, and we could leave a meeting, you know, still um, understanding that, uh, you know, we are here for the same reason, right, and, and the same outcome, and sometimes we may come at it a little bit differently, but you know, you, uh, I, I really appreciate. Um, your willingness, you know, to to sit in this seat, uh, and um, and really spend the time uh, to 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 really grow your knowledge and make informed decisions on behalf of you know our uh, this fourth largest school district in the state of Arizona. But um, I thank you for your kind heart, uh, and uh, and again, just your. Uh, your respect and uh, you know willingness to, to put yourself out there for for another and um, you know that's a that's a quality that um, you know I, I definitely that, that definitely inspires me you know about you so thank you um, and I'll say congratulations to both of you um, for the time and uh, you know and uh, looking forward to you know that next chapter and also welcome Dr. Sorensen and Ms. Hill uh, looking forward to working with the, the two of you over the next four years. So thank you both. Ms. Diane Martinez, yes, please. All right. Well, I will be mindful of the three minutes, um, but I'm going to ask for credit in the future when I come back. Uh, Ms. Stone, I admire you. You are a mom and a strong woman in our community, and you still brought your daughter and your granddaughter to the meetings because you felt and you feel and you show that service is important. Thank you, because you are a role model for many women in our community. Um, and when I walk away here, I will remember now and in the future that I can do those things as well as service, so thank you. Uh, it has been four years, and I did a quick math calculation for Ms. Myers, a little bit more accuracy, 1400, uh, about 1,400 days, 1,400. Um, time goes by fast when you're in the heat of the moment. Every year it felt like something was happening, and new board members, it's going to blink and I welcome you and thank you for choosing uh, to serve our community. Uh, more voices to the table. 
I do have to acknowledge Ms. Beverly Pangarelli. Uh, you are my friend. You are part of my family. And in family, we love and we argue. And I called her many times, and I want the community to know that she listens. You listen to me. And I bounced ideas from you, and you even said, mm, Monica, you probably should refrain from saying it that way. <laughs> um, you are a wonderful wife. I aspire to be that way. What you offer, Dr. Pangarelli, is amazing. And you are a strong woman, and the courage that you have, you're very mindful with your words. Um, tactful, respectful, professional, and in families, we argue, but you never out outstepped and felt like I was, you never put me down or made me feel like I was less than. Thank you, thank you. For my community, you need to know that when you serve, your family sacrifices whatever you're doing. My husband sacrificed a lot. Um, my children, my boys, and I need to be home with them right now during COVID. When we were in circles with my parents, I hear you, I heard you, and I wanted to cry because I'm going through those same things. A child with special needs, chronic lung disease, academic challenges, I hear you. I'm a mom first. For my family, my brothers, my volunteer of the year always, <laughs> slash campaign manager, slash biggest critic, slash news reporter, <laughs> slash social media expert, um, and my little brother who's my heart and soul. My parents are home watching. Uh, I couldn't do what I do without my Peoria Unified family and the Seha Martinez family. I am who I am in President Sandoval, governing board, you the nail on the head. I grew so much because of all of my cabinet. There is no longer the district in my eyes, the DAC in my eyes. I may not always agree. <laughs> and I'll text you now that I have your numbers. <laughs> um, I will end with this. I am big on diversity and inclusion for the right reasons, because I value Mr. Guthrich's opinions his tactical, strategic, analytical thought process. I also value Miss uh, Kelly Carbello, who leads with her heart and is a social worker and her masters and talks about social and emotional learning because those ideas are important. Miss Vermin A. Myers, and hopefully I don't mess up this quote, said, diversity is about inviting people to the dance Inclusion is about asking them to dance, or to, to dance with you. Belonging is playing their music. In the Pure Unified District, we have a unique chorus, sound, and dance. Please recognize that that is so important, and I love living in my community. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's been a ride. Um, I would like to thank, first of all, my best friend, Jesus Christ. I am very proud of him. I'm very proud of the people on this board and our community. And I want to say, um, but for the grace of God, I would not have been able to do this at all. Um, Monica, I admire your energy. I envy your energy. <laughs> um, and I have watched you grow. And um, I remember when I first met you, um, I think you were a little bit of a different person at that time. And um, I hope that you continue to be able to um, pursue the things that are important to you and to give to the community. But I, I do recognize that it's been a lot. It has been a lot. And I hope that your family and you are able to spend some time together and just bond. And um, 
the I like the way that you don't mind embarrassing yourself by by getting into something and finding out what's going on you're never afraid that you've made a mistake or anything you're just like I'm gonna learn this and I I think that's a very uh, cool attitude I like that um, thank you for um, the service that you provided this community and our kids and that happens to be my phone and I'm very sorry I thought I had turned it off <laughs> Um, that was my sister. That was my sister. I'm sorry, um, but I I do. I think that we volunteer because we love our families. We love our community, and um, it was a hard piece of work. But I I saw that you put anybody that looked at the work you did could tell you put in a lot of hours on it, and I appreciate that. Um, Beverly, I want to say that um, you've been an inspiration to me because I hate the math. <laughs> I really hate the math, you guys. And I, I, not that I don't understand it, but I just, I hate it. Um, and I can always count on Beverly to get the nitpicky questions about the math, and that's, that's really good for me. And it, it encouraged me to be a little more disciplined in that area. And also, Beverly, you're never um, shy. Uh, it, you are polite and you are respectful, but you always give your true opinion. And I, I appreciate that. And, and I have, have learned to very much respect that. And I, I, have, I have loved working on the board with you. And I do hope that, you know, friendships will happen. Um, real ones, deep ones. Um, Corey, uh, we never got to know each other all that well. You don't sit close enough for me to kick. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you're, you're not quite as voluble as Monica and David. But you do, you do say, I like that you um, ask questions and, and you're not worried about it. I like that. I like that... Um, you had the experience um, of being a teacher and, and you bring that to the board, but also that you can see through a different eye now, that things aren't just from the teacher's point of view, we have to look from the children and different people in the community, parents especially. And um, I watched myself grow when I got on this board and I've watched you grow and uh, it's very encouraging and thank you so much. And David, um, he's almost close enough to kick, but not quite. There's a big desk under. Here. <laughs> you, you've tried a few times. I have. <laughs> no, no, it's it's um, it's been a, it's been an experience working with you, Dave. And I I would like to say to you got David is a gentleman. David is a real gentleman, and he's kind, and he's considerate, and. Um, sometimes a little long-winded but his heart is in helping the people of this community and while we disagree frequently <laughs> on how to do that I know that that's where your heart is uh, with you know encouraging the people in this district and helping them to um, add their voice so um, I have enjoyed working with you. And I just want to include Dr. Reynolds and say, um, you're my fourth superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> and there have been and some. And last. And last. There have been some that I liked better than others. <laughs> but this has been my spot. I have always sat by the superintendent, and I've liked that. It's, um, it gives me a little bit, every once in a while we can say a little something that is just, um, it's never personal, but it may be just a little aside, like you say to a comrade, to someone in the trenches with you. And um, I've appreciated that, and I missed it when we were not in person, I was like, this is not right. We don't, we don't see each other's face, we don't get to, 
Um, I mean, it's hard enough as a board when we can't communicate. We're not allowed to communicate with each other. And it's hard to um, be up here and try to iron out differences, you know, and, and say things. But I have appreciated you and I appreciate the way that you stood behind Mrs. Pallas Thompson and, and jumped in when she needed you. And um, I appreciate the way that you have taken over and your leadership and your friendship, which is, you know, that's a good thing. I would like to welcome our new board members and let you know that um, Peoria is a special place. And I hope that it can grow. I hope that you will be I hope that you'll be able to find the correct paths, the way that our children this world it's hard. This world is getting harder. And I'm I pray that you'll be able to add to this board the correct dynamics, that our children will receive the very best that you have to offer, that there will be no self-interest, no political maneuvering, and that the board as a whole will put our children first and our community, and that Peoria will be able to continue as a place where children can learn and children can be uplifted and that this will be better next year than it is this year. I know that we have had issues in the past and people say it's, it's financing or it's the pandemic or it's, uh, I don't know what, but they're needs to be a depth of work. There needs to be a depth of understanding. There, it's going to take a lot of time from you individually. And that's a hard thing to give. As you've heard us testify tonight, your family may resent it. I, I don't know your families. I have no idea. It's a lot of hard work to give to your community that way. And it... Um, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to know that you can make a difference. And it might not be a big difference. You're one voice of five. But I congratulate you and I hope that you will seek assistance to make the very best decisions and that our children will benefit and that they will be able to grow up into a well-adjusted and happy and, and, you know, as profitable a person as they can. I don't believe that every person has to be profitable. I believe there are people that are on the earth, like my daughter Amy, that are just there so that we can be good to them and grow through them. And I believe that there are people that uh, need just that little nudge to help them be profitable to themselves and to the community and stuff. I, I, I want to thank our whole community for this opportunity that I've had to serve. I didn't want to. I really didn't. But um, it has been very good. It's been good for me. I kind of like to live in my little shell sometimes. And I'm talking a lot more than I usually do, but I had it coming. You deserve it. Um, when I teach my children in Sunday school, I always try to remind them of the importance of learning things. And I teach the Bible. That's not what our teachers teach in school. But the importance is there to pick up, to learn, and, and a child has to be encouraged and enjoy the learning. And we can't have all these um, fears and dissension and um, 
hidden motivations and things like that that go on because people are people. So I just want to say uh, I hope things turn out better next year. I hope things, I hope the pandemic it goes away. I don't think it's going to just go away. But I hope that our children are free to breathe without masks. I, I hate putting my granddaughter, my five-year-old granddaughter in a mask. I don't think that's healthy for her. I hope that your children are free next year. And I hope that all your family is well in our community. I hope that um, more parents will become involved. Do not hesitate to come and talk to the board. We are just people. We are glad to hear from you because we need your help. And um, I think I included a whole bunch of people, but I want to speak to cabinet. You guys are wonderful. And I don't, I don't always uh, enjoy the really long presentations. <laughs> I will tell you that. I mean, um, because I've read them ahead of time, you know? And, um, but you guys do a, a pretty, really good job. And um, I would, I would uh, like to say cut down on the acronyms so that people in the public can understand, please. Um, because uh, I think our community would like to understand what's going on in here. And I think that some of our community are afraid of this. And it's nothing to be afraid of. And, we, and, and our community should not. All our parents are welcome here and everybody else so um thank you to all of you and for your help that you've given me and 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 our community and uh, for sitting here late at night while i ramble on anyway love to all of you and thank you so much thank you thank you So are, you, are we moving on to superintendent's comments? Oh, sorry. Do we need to skip? Uh, oh, we actually moving on to, yeah, state point three. Yeah, let's do that and then uh, we can skip state point three. All right, perfect. Thank Good. You. Well, let me be, uh, I don't know, the 10th, 12th, 15th person to, to uh, welcome uh, Mrs. Hill and Dr. Sorensen. You obviously have big shoes to fill, but we have all the confidence in you in the world and are very thankful uh, that you stepped up and, uh, and took the risk and ran uh, and are now uh, ready to uh, serve this community. So thank you very much. Uh, two, our two exiting governing board members. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say thank you for allowing me to become part of the Peoria Unified Family. Uh, the way that you have welcomed me and, uh, and encouraged me and supported me is uh, incredibly um, thoughtful of you, and, and I'm very, very thankful. Uh, Ms. Doan, I will forever appreciate your passion. You, you just explained it. Your passion for student learning, uh, the way that you advocate for students, uh, all students, but students with special needs, students who need additional supports. Uh, you, you remind us every day about the responsibility to be inclusive and ensure every child has access to a high level education. Uh, I truly admire your independence, your willingness to listen, uh, and your, your deep, deep faith. Uh, it, it has made this board better, it has made this community better, uh, and your leadership on this board has made a difference. Uh, and I, too, have enjoyed sitting next to you. We don't have anything to keep you from kicking me. But I never so, have tried. I, but you have not, not yet. <laughs> it was only six months. So, <laughs> Mrs. Seha Martinez, I cherish our conversations and your insights. You have proved uh, and provided so much context to the, the decisions of the past to help me understand more about this community uh, and all the things that uh, you are committed to uh, and the way that you have committed yourself to this community is, is just extraordinary and, and it should be celebrated. Uh, a community member wrote this. You, you mentioned her earlier, Kelly Corbello. She, she wrote this about you to me uh, and I think it's, it's very appropriate. Mrs. Seha Martinez listens and not just for pause. 
She wants to know everything about everything because of all the decisions made and how they affect students. She does all of this for them. She wants to advocate for them. She wants to protect them. She wants to give them their best chance at success. And if it, mean, it means doing all of the above, she will do it, and she has done it. I believe that when each of you look into the eyes of the children of this district, you see your own children, you see your grandchildren, uh, and you understand how important the work that you do is, uh, and we thank you. We will miss you both um, so much. Uh, I, I admire, Ms. Seha Martinez, I admire your passion, your persistence, your intelligent, intelligence, your charisma. Um, we will, again, miss you so much and uh, appreciate your leadership on this board, and we look forward to seeing all the great things that are going to happen in your future, so thank you. All right, we've got a few more recognitions before we start our, uh, our business. So uh, these are some, some great things that have been happening over the district. Uh, President uh, Sandoval, I think Ms. Don and I can go to ice cream now. Uh, oh, that's right. <laughs> cake. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we have some exciting news to share since the last time we met. Sunrise Mountains, Daniel Matheson broke the 500 free state record at the Arizona D2 State Swim Championships. Excellent. He set a new meet record with a time of 4 minutes 20 Second six and four twenty sixty four uh, this November. The former record was held from a student from another school, but it hasn't been beat since two thousand and fourteen. He was also named the AIA Division Two Male Swimmer of the Year, uh, and we understand that he is committed to the University of Southern California, uh, and we are very excited to to see what his future holds. So, congratulations, Daniel, uh, Liam Beltram. That name might sound familiar to, uh, to this group. He's a senior at Liberty High School. He has been selected as one of the five Arizona nominees for the 2020-21 U.S. Presidential Scholars in Career and Technical Education. Shocking. Yes. Uh, his mother, by the way, that's, in case that's an inside joke, his mother was the former director of career and technical education uh, here in Peoria. He was selected by a review team consisting of CTE stakeholders based on uh, evidence of academic rigor, technical competence, professional employability skills, and ingenuity and creativity. As one of the five Arizona nominees, uh, Liam was selected by the Arizona Superintendent of Public and Instruction, Kathy Hoffman, and was submitted by her office to the Commission on Presidential Scholars at the U.S. Department of Education, where his mother now works. Uh, as a semifinalist nominee, he will be invited to apply for the National Review by the Commission on Pres Presidential Scholars at the U.S. Department of Education. We're really excited for him. The city of Peoria recently released uh, a wonderful video highlighting our community. It was shared to promote small business, but included uh, many great aspects of our region, including our very own Met Professional Academy students. We're so proud to be part of this community and thankful for Barb Coakley, uh, our director, uh, and her entire team. It was a wonderful surprise to be included in, in that video. Uh, I would also like to recognize Mrs. Carol Rubert from Desert Palms Elementary. She was named the September 2020 Teacher of the Month for AZPTA. This recognition just came to us, and we are thrilled to have one of our incredible teachers on this list who are chosen for their creativity in the classroom. We know it's been a challenging year, but appreciate our teachers for continuing to support their students as they as they do every single day uh, and again during this pandemic it's it's been very very challenging and we appreciate all of you and congratulations carol uh, next ironwood high school principal mr russ dunham family member in the you can say you can okay all right fist this award is given oh i'm sorry uh, he recently received the arizona thespian administrator of the year award uh, the award is given annually to a principal that demonstrates exceptional courage and devotion to the performing arts. Mr. Dunham was chosen for the encouragement he gives to his theater program, and uh, which is one of the best in the state. So congratulations, Mr. Dunham. 
Likewise, a congratulation is in order for Stephen Bowyer, our principal at Kachina Elementary School. Uh, he has just received a doctorate of education in organizational leadership with an emphasis in K-12 with an organizational leadership with an emphasis in K-12 leadership from Grand Canyon University. Uh, his dissertation entitled, all right, take a breath. Elementary teachers' perceptions of their preparedness in implementing blended learning. Uh, that is a classic dissertation title. I love that. Uh, it was a qualitative single case study that examined elementary, elementary teachers' perceptions on the influence of, that their experiences, readiness to learn, and motivation had on their preparedness to implement the blended learning model within the student learning environment. So Dr. Ballier, congratulations. And lastly, I want to say thank you to the uh, entire team for an updated governing board room. Uh, those of us who've been attending for four years or more uh, have noticed that we, we did a few, a few changes. So Mike Tregoboff, Ms. Contra, Mr. Panzer, your entire team, David Colley, Christian in the back, thank you for uh, uh, making sure that uh, our, our uh, uh, boardroom is is one where we look out and we see the faces uh, that we're impacting every day so thank you to all and that concludes my comments for this evening very good thank you dr. Reynolds okay moving on to section 9 public comments we do have a couple individuals uh, wishing to speak at this time uh, just uh, from a housekeeping perspective we do uh, keep public comment to 30 minutes in its entirety, its entirety, and then three minutes per individual. Thank you, Ms. Stone, for clarifying that. So, <laughs> that said, the uh, first individual uh, in this category is uh, Ms. Uh, Devin Updegraff Day. Uh, good evening, Governing Board. I've requested to speak a few times this evening, so this will be the first issue. And I wanted to start off with revisiting the mask uh, policy that um, was never completed, and in particular, of course, exemptions. On October 22nd, the board discussed mask exemption policy, and at the end of the meeting, Mrs. Pingarelli and Mrs. Um, had brought up the request of an examination discussion and the possibility of the board taking over um, the regulation, and it wants. she had requested it to be added to the agenda for the November 12th meeting. Here we are seven weeks later, and even a mention of developing an official mass policy has yet to occur. I assume, assume you have all read Governor Ducey's executive order as uh, the Arizona Open for Learning. I brought a specific portion along here tonight, which states that all school districts and charter schools shall develop and implement a policy to require face coverings such as face mask shields for all staff and students until it is no longer necessary. In section B, students shall incorporate other restrictions and exemptions consistent with the guidance from the CDC and prevention. Um, now we've talked about all the issues um, with not allowing mask exemptions prior. Uh, but per this order, this district is required to create a mask policy. This is not up for discussion. This is not up to the superintendent and was most certainly not a regulation. This policy has, was to be discussed publicly and to be voted on by the board. We are now halfway through the school year, about five months, and this board has yet to even have a clear discussion on the mask policy, let alone a vote. Again, per Governor Ducey, this is not optional. Also, at the October 22nd meeting, both Mrs. Pingrelli and Mrs. Martinez asked multiple relevant questions, questions such as the number of students requesting mask accommodations, the number of students in quarantine at that time, and that those that had been uh, exposed to a positive COVID-19 student um, who also then tested positive from exposure. Uh, the board task force wasn't able to answer any of those questions. Those questions were all reasonable uh, and nothing outlandish. And I would hope tonight and in the future, the task force comes prepared and actually answered, I'm prepared to answer some of those questions. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Reynolds and cabinet, if we can make sure that uh, we get back to Ms. Subtograph Day uh, on her concerns and questions and comments, please. 
The next public comment is from Ms. Heather Rooks. Uh, what she said. <laughs> um, uh, good evening, uh, board members. Um, yeah, I'm here today, obviously, because you all did help out with our son Emmett Rooks um, with his disability um, and not being able to tolerate a face mask shield. Um, so I'm here today because I would like to know if it's still up for discussion um, and that it needs to be voted on for other kids that have disabilities. I have had a parent reach out to me, um, kind of lost um, because they have a child that will be coming into the district and they just don't know what to do because they're in the same scenario that um, we are and our son was. Um, so I appreciate all that you did for helping Emmett. Um, he's enjoying school right now and loves his friends. Um, so yeah, I just would like to, you know, make sure that we still think of those other kids out there um, in the district. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rooks. Dr. Reynolds and Cabinet, uh, if we can make sure we get back to Ms. Rooks as well, please. All right, we have no other public comment. The rest of the public comment is tied to um, actual agenda line items. So we will move on to section 10, consent agenda. Does any board member have any of these line items uh, that they wish they would like, that, that they would wish to pull? Ms. Stone? Nothing. Ms. Underhill? No, thank you. Ms. Pingrelli? Ms. Sam Martinez? Just one. Okay. 10.24, uh, the MOU with CCV for emergency support services. Right. Please. I'll second that. Board members, I do need a motion to approve the consent agenda minus 10.24. I move that we approve the consent agenda minus item 10.24. I'll second. Ms. Contra, we have a motion by Ms. Underhill and a second by Ms. Stone. <laughs> Board members, please cast your vote. All right, we'll move on to um, section 11, 11.1, I believe. Uh, memorandum of understanding with Christ Church of the Valley for emergency support services. Ms. Sayon Martinez. Thank you very much, Dr. Reynolds. You and I uh, briefly touched base on this based on some feedback we received from the community. Can you help me understand the scope of work CCV will be providing in regards to the MOU and why uh, this is coming forward? I'm just looking to the cabinet to see if do you want to tackle that or I would be happy to Dr. Okay, Reynolds President Sandoval Mrs. Seha Martinez they are providing with us us with a space in the event of an emergency that would cause us to have to evacuate and relocate students uh, as well as some additional resources and supports uh, on their site that would help facilitate the process of that reunification and Mrs. Seha Martinez I would just add to that 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 is it's simply logistics uh, supports and, and they have a, a wonderful team that they reach out to 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 help support us in the case that we have to uh, relocate uh, any of our students from around the district thank you very much for that follow-up as well and thank you for that feedback um, my only ask is going for because I know uh, we have had an emergency operations plan for quite some time and I know there's some state legislation about how much can be available to the public that we just be mindful of what they need to know in order so we can execute a safe environment for everybody thank you good thank you Board members, any other questions or comments on this particular line item? Uh, Ms. Stone? No, thank you. Okay. Ms. Underhill? I just want to say that, sorry, I just want to say that I, that I do appreciate that partnership. It's excellent, and I'm glad that we are moving forward with that. So thank you. Ms. Ping, really? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sam Martinez. 
I do need a motion to approve uh, 11.1 memorandum, memorandum of understanding with Christ Church of the Valley for emergency support services. So moved. I second. Ms. Contra, we have a motion by Ms. Doan and a second by Ms. Sam Martinez. Board members, please cast your votes. Motion passes, 5-0. Thank you, board members. Moving on to section 12, 12.1, consideration of revision number one to the maintenance and operations district additional assistance and classroom site funds for fiscal year 2020, 2021. Thank, thank you, President Sandoval, members at the governing board. I do not have additional comments to add from the public hearing. Okay. Thank you. Board members, any uh, additional questions for Ms. Myers? Uh, Ms. Dunn? No. Ms. Underhill? Thank you. Ms. Underhill? No. Ms. Okay. Perfect. All right. I do need a motion to uh, approve 12.1. President Sandoval, I move to approve 12.1 as presented tonight. I'll second that. Ms. Contra, we have a motion by Ms. Sam Martinez and a second by myself. Board members, please cast your votes. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, board members. Moving on to 12.2, curriculum and instruction new course change proposal. We do have some public comment tied to this line item. Um, we will listen to public comment prior to board comments and questions, okay? So, Dr. Bell. Good evening, President Sandoval, governing board members, Dr. Reynolds, and our community. This evening, we are asking for approval for an elective course. This is an elective that typically uh, second uh, semester juniors or seniors would take because the prerequisite to this course is our own current American history course. The new course entitled American Studies aligns to the new history and social studies standards adopted in October of 2018. The concept of this course was brought to Centennial Administration by Alexa Hart, a Centennial alumni who's with us this evening. The American Studies course will explore the experiences and perspectives of a diverse array of American groups and study concepts like identity, race, and ethnicity. It will help students make personal connections to their own local and global histories. Students will engage in case studies as they move chronologically from 1492 to contemporary America. The course will help deepen student understanding of American history by analyzing multiple perspectives of historical events from diverse viewpoints. That is a central standard in the new social sciences uh, curriculum for the state, the analyzing, examining, those multiple perspectives um, by diverse people. With me this evening is Diane Dunham, who has agreed to teach this course and help uh, develop the course. Jen Mundy and Michelle Bentevenia, our social studies content experts, are here should you have questions associated with the content. Marla Hobbs, uh, Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction, as well as Brandy Steele, Assistant Principal at uh, Centennial High School. I want to make a, a quick comment that I had an opportunity to talk to Mr. Hollibaugh, who was unable to be with us tonight. I talked with him this afternoon. He has surveyed his uh, junior, senior students for interest in this course and believes that we would have at least one section. That conversation, that polling, et cetera, with the students is similar to the superintendent's conversations as we move through our district with high school students um, looking for a more personalized, a deeper course, particularly at that junior and senior year. I will pause for, I believe, public comments, and then the team will take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bell. We'll pause for a moment uh, for the podium to be 
disinfected. Thank you, sir. All right, our first public comment regarding this line item is Alexa Hart. Um, good evening, I'm Alexa Hart. I am a senior in Northern Arizona's Honors College, majoring in philosophy, politics, and law with minors in economics and ethnic studies. Um, I proposed this American Studies course to encapsulate the subject matter I wish I had been taught in high school. As an African American, I did not feel seen or heard in my, my high school courses. I've learned that all students deserve to be seen in their education. Education possesses the special right to mold the minds of the future. Therefore, we ought to mold the minds to a standard of truth and inclusion. American studies will enable students to truly understand the nation's past and celebrate its diversity. The course will instill historical empathy and understanding for all Americans. In a time where racial conflicts run rampant, it is our duty to educate others to understand how our country arrived at this point. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hart. And the next public comment regarding this line item is Ms. Uptograph Day. All right, hello again. All right, so my next comment, of course, is in regard to this uh, new elective at Centennial High School. The board will be discussing this course shortly, and I want to express my strong disapproval. Uh, the provided description of the course has kind of been um, already discussed, so I won't go into too much more detail um, from what was on the agenda. Uh, but first off, I was disappointed to learn that board members um, were given limited information on this course prior to this meeting. It, my understanding is they didn't see the PowerPoint or really get much information prior. Um, so that was disappointing because I would have wished they'd had time to kind of look into the background. But now let's be clear, this, focus, this course is focused on teaching students the minority perspective throughout American history. And let me just say, as a taxpayer-funded institution, I consider it out of line to promote ideas that denounce the genius of our forefathers in a country that has done nothing but provide opportunities for those willing to work. American history is not about victimization, and in the words of Candace Owen, the belief that white Americans should be responsible for the shortcomings of black America or any minority, for, any, for that matter, is a form of white power. One must believe the, the black minority inferiority is except the thesis that the minorities are not responsible for their own shortcomings in society. The most valuable lesson one can learn from every country that practiced slavery, and those countries that still practice slavery today, is that slave owners maintained their power over slaves through the laws that made it illegal for slaves to learn how to read or write. The simple fact perfectly demonstrates the importance of literacy, as it is extremely difficult to control an educated mind. I bring up this fact because according to the public school review, currently only 46% of PUSD high school students are proficient in reading. Even your top performing school, Centennial, scored a 56% in reading proficiency and ranked at um, 135th of all Arizona public high schools. Now, PUSD, PUSD proficiency in both math and reading are above state average, but is that really something to brag about? Last I checked, at 48% proficiency in reading and a 51% in math is failing. Students cannot compete in a competitive world market if they are not proficient in reading and math. Now, a district that loves to brag about a 93% graduation rate, but are you aware that 40% of college students drop out and 30% do so before their sophomore year? Why? Because they're not prepared and they are not ready. Do you see the problem? This is a college course, not a high school course, which is why she's learning these courses in college. Stop diluting student education with political correct, feel-good propaganda. If a student chooses to learn about a different perspective in American history, then they need to go to the library, they can borrow a book, and read about it on their own time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Optograph Day.
The next public comment regarding this line item is Ms. Christina Rogers. I am definitely not as well-spoken as her, but I definitely second <laughs> what she said. My thing is I really want the curriculum being br brought to you guys and people to look over it mm -hmm. because I really feel that a lot of the points that they're suggesting on teaching on is something that a parent should be doing and a child, like she said, can go to the library and get their information on their own. I think some of the information is definitely a parent's responsibility and that's where it should stay. It is not the school's responsibility to teach our children this information. It is a parent's responsibility to teach this information. I think the teachers need to continue to do the math, the English, the reading, things like that. And like she said, in college is a place where students at that time when they are fully grown and adults can make their own decision and go get that information from college. It should not be put in our elementaries, in our high schools, until the curriculum is totally laid out so we can all see it and vote on. I don't think it's something that should pass at this time. Thank you. The next public comment regarding this line item is Ms. Becky Smith. Um, I didn't come prepared with statistics or anything. I'm just basically coming from a parent and my own personal experience as a parent. I have a, I'm the mother of a high school senior and an eighth grade son and um, my fear is this type of curriculum will actually breed more racism and more divide in our country rather than unity. It saddened me how I have witnessed my own children lose friendships because their friends make assumptions about them. They tell them they are priv privileged because they're white or they are bad people because their dad is a police officer. So, so many of my kids closest and best friends who were f basically like family to us and welcomed in our own home have now totally disregarded my own children as wh the people that they know they are the years that they've spent with them just based on all the rhetoric that's going around so i i fear that this is actually taking a step backward um because uh i'd rather empower people in minority groups to rise above and not um, do anything that's going to create a victim mentality that if you're born a certain way that you're now not afforded the same options in our country that everyone else is because I think we live in a country where if you put forth the effort there's opportunities out there for everyone so that's just as a parent what I'm noticing and it's very sad Thank you, Ms. Smith. The next public comment um, regarding this line item is Ms. Heather Rooks. Hi again. Um, so um, I'm here to express why I think you need to vote no on this curriculum uh, instruction. Um, I also believe that this type of instruction belongs in a college course. Um, I did take some college courses and I feel this is more adult topic versus high school and elementary. Um, as a parent, I do not want this to be taught to my kids. Uh, I don't believe it belongs in an elementary school and high school. I see it as marked as an elective, but we know everything starts somewhere and continues to grow. Um, I'm afraid that if the district approves this, then it will open the door for it to be a requirement across the distri district. Um, and I guess my, you know, uh, I heard um, Dr. Kendra Bell speak and say that there was a survey done to the high school students 
Um, I guess my question would be, why was there not a survey done to the parents? Mm -hmm. They are under the age of 18. We are their guardians. Um, and I'd also like to just point out that if this topic is to be considered a requirement, um, then why is there no courses on learning about the Bible, mm -hmm. Jesus, and our Lord? That's just coming from my opinion. Um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Next public comment regarding this line item is Ms. Linda Busson. Hello, my name is Linda Bosom, and I want to thank the Governing School Board for letting me speak today. Um, you know, I grew up on welfare in the Chicago's projects during the 1960s. Um, I faced such situations that children should have never even seen before. Um, and yet I feel blessed. I've had these, feel these uh, experiences because I've gained determination, wisdom, and grit by refusing to be defeated. This is a crucible called life. And it's the American dream to become everything you can be or not. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the co uh, content of their character. Boy, we come a long way from those precious words of wisdom. Before the governing school board, today is a vote for a new curriculum that appears well-intentioned, appealing, even empathetic, but in actuality further divides us. When you peel back the layers of this onion, you will see that it promotes taking from one group in, it, in order to compensate a second group to correct injustices caused by a third group who mistreated a fourth group by an earlier point, an earlier point in history. It's absurd. Not only does it uh, not promote justice, it does, it does the opposite. It promotes racism. And you cannot cure racism with more racism. This system, uh, ra um, systemic racism and white privilege is ideology and politics. Um, yet the National Education Association feels it's their duty to indoctrinate our children and further strip parents of their rights to teach their children their values and their morals. They want to teach a revisionist American history that teaches victimhood, entitlement, and the loathing for our country. We do not want or need this curriculum in our Peoria schools. We need to find ways that unite us, focus on good character, focus on shared values, focus on being an upstanding individual who has big dreams and goals. If our goal is to truly heal relationships, then let's talk about loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Our common values like respect, honesty, and trustworthiness. That's what unites people. I pray that the uh, Peoria Governing School Board uses great wisdom and votes no on this new curriculum. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wiesel. The next public, public comment regarding this line item is Mr. Mark Rooks. Thank you, board. Uh, real quickly, um, I'm, I'm uh, Heather's father-in-law. Uh, Emmett Rooks is my uh, grandson. So uh, I have, he's one of eight grandkids that I have in the system. Um, <clears throat> so I started, I, I was born in St. Joe's Hospital in 1957 here in town. Um, graduated from Glendale High School, went to ASU, and uh, so I am definitely a lifer here. I think, Mr. Sandoval, you are also yes, sir. here, is that right? Okay. Alhambra. Uh, do you remember Wallace and Ladmo? I do. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, so I'm here to talk about this, uh, the American Studies uh, curriculum. Um, the recent events 
have brought to light the, the failure of our education system. And I should have taken this off earlier. Uh, the young people we witnessed rioting and looting in some of our largest cities came out of an education system that had taught them to hate America. I think that's really sad. <clears throat> the source of the hatred can be traced directly to the emphasis on identity culture, which separates us into inter special interest groups. Each group is isolated from the other by mistrust, stemming from perceived grievances and artificial cultural barriers. The class, the class be being proposed to this body known as American Studies is one that continues the misguided methods of emphasizing the negative differences between American citizens. <clears throat> this country is not a country of racism or sexism or any kind of ism. We are tired of the continual drumbeat of our educational system as you use the program of our kids to, to program our kids into thinking that America is a country of hate and division. It is not. Please vote no on adding this misguided curriculum into our schools and let's stop sacrificing our children on the altar of political correctness. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rooks. Next public comment regarding this line item is Ms. K. I believe it's, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Welcome. Welcome, I'm glad that you are welcoming me. I have two nephews that are attending Peoria school uh, things and I am very concerned about them tonight. When I heard that you were presenting this type of curriculum, now my background is I have a, I'm a philosophy major from Colorado State University Pueblo. And I, and I have been involved with different political groups and everything else and, and I know how liberal the colleges are, you know, and, and producing uh, leadership for the, today's future because uh, I was involved with certain things on campus and I beat the National Student Association, a very liberal group, by the two to one margin and that this is my type of background. And I am very concerned. I think, first, first of all, I think uh, the curriculum that Hillsdale College has is wonderful. You know, and I think that we need to look, look as far as more curriculums and put more uh, um, studies like that and they, and it's a, it's a very great college in Hillsdale Michigan another thing I would recommend is a as a study of the Constitution most people don't know the Constitution and I want my nephews to learn the Constitution of the United States before they graduate from from high school and um, since my this is uh, my nephews I'm very concerned about them. I want them to have the best education. And I think that this course would be uh, really uh, divisive in nature. And I would uh, recommend that you uh, vote against this course and put something like a constitutional class in, uh, at this, this junior and senior level as an elective. Thank you for your time and you take care. Thank you. We do have one final public comment regarding this line item, and it is from Ms. Trina Berg. Good evening, President Sandoval, members of the board, Dr. Center, uh, wow, hello, that was a weird throwback. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> I've been here for a while. Dr. Reynolds, members of cabinet. Um, first off, I just wanna say thank you to a former PUSC student who saw a need for something that we might need in school and came back and is trying to make a difference for students that are still moving through our system. Um, honestly, I'm a little confused why this is such a controversial thing. We, we have a history that is very controversial and we should be okay with discussing this. Um, it's an elective course. We're not saying anyone has to take it. So if you don't want your child to take it, then don't sign them up for that. And if they turn 18 as a senior and they want to take it, they can take it, they're 18. Um, I believe that down in Tucson, the cultural studies was already upheld in court. So these types of programs, these types of um, classes are absolutely allowed to be taught in school. 
excuse me. So I'm really confused by the, why this is such an issue. Um, not every person has the same not every person has the same experience in their house. And so they have, should have an opportunity through our school system to learn new perspectives. This is how we overcome some of the past issues that have been brought to light and have become a very driving force in our political landscape right now. Um, so honestly, I'm in full support of this, of, of this course and I really hope that you choose to adopt this course and that we start at Centennial and then eventually spread it through the rest of our high schools. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Burke. And thank you to everybody uh, for taking the time and using this line item um, for what it's for, which is uh, expressing your, your comments, concerns, and having questions of the, the board and the district. So really appreciate that. That said, we can move on to board comment and questions uh, regarding this line item. Ms. Stone? Oh, I have a lot. Um, first off, I want to ask the relationship and differences between this curriculum and the 1619 project curriculum. So, Dr. Bell? I apologize. I was having a conversation about the dais. Could you repeat that, please? I would like to know the correlation and differences between this curriculum and the Project 19, that 1619 curriculum. I'm going to ask Jen Mundy to answer that question for us. Jen is our social sciences um, curriculum content expert. Thank you, Jen. Good evening, members of the board. Um, I am familiar with the 1619 project, not in depth. Um, I've had conversations with the ADE about it. It's recommended that it be used as a resource to examine a perspective, not as a curriculum, but as one resource to look at perspectives, because our new standards are all about multiple perspectives, looking at diversity, looking at different people's experiences. So this course, from what I've seen, the resources that Alexa and the people that she worked with to develop this and kind of brainstorm it, and I know the whole course hasn't been developed, I didn't even see the 1619 project in there as a resource when they were looking at case studies. So um, I didn't see it in there. So there is no correlation directly between the 1619 project and this course. All right. Um. Why is it that we have not seen this curriculum? My understanding is the course has to be approved before the actual curriculum can be written. And so the course proposal was put forth. I don't vote for something I can't see. I don't vote and then see it later. That's ridiculous. <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to approve something I haven't. Our parents, uh, why, what is this transparency? Why have our parents not seen this? Why has this not been in the lobby like our English laws? Mrs. Doan, I'd like to answer that. We, um, we take course proposals from our schools, bring the concept to the governing board for approval, and then write curriculum with teacher teams, um, the teacher who's going to teach this course, and with our content specialist. It's not necessarily an adoption, a textbook adoption, which is when you see materials out in lobbies as required by our governing board policy. Tonight, we're asking the governing board to approve the concept. Um, then we go to work and engage teachers and others in writing curriculum content. So how do we know what's going to be in there? Are they going to teach that this country was founded uh, to preserve slavery? No, I don't think we are looking for any kind of white ethnocentric curriculum. It's just simply a multiple perspectives from diverse viewpoints. That's the state standard. Did you have something you wanted to I was, add? Yeah, just didn't want to. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, at any time we could 
uh, hold a study session as we continue to build out uh, that course of study uh, for the board to to review. So, I mean, this this kind of teaching throughout our countries where our cities are burning down. It is, and it causes very much division among people that were once friends. Um, and a victim mentality and identity politics are the last thing our kids need when they're trying to study English and math and real history that has been documented. Uh, perspectives may be all good and well in college and things like that, but our students need a basic understanding and, and good understanding of where we came from. How, how are we coming on constitutional classes? Is that in the works? We don't have a class named the Constitution. We do have that in our American history course. Yeah, I studied that, and I, I think that's definitely recommended for us. Um, President there. Sandoval, may yes, I ask Ms. Doan a question real quick sure. for clarity? You asked for, uh, you stated victim, the victimization is being taught. Where did you see that? Because I, I am not finding it. Where, help me understand where you saw that or where you read it. All right. Um, this course will help to cultivate respect and historical empathy for experiences, struggles, and achievements of a variety of American identities, uh, including African Americans, Asian Americans, naked. you know, you read the whole list. And all you do is hear these groups talk about being bullied, victim, not being seen, not being heard. And it's, it's, it's all talking about identity politics. So just for clarity, you don't actually see the word victimization, but you're interpreting it in fear of it being presented that way. Is that correct? in fear of? Well, I'm just trying to understand where you saw the word victimization so that I could follow along. Why would I need to see the word? Well, I'm just seeing if you're making an assumption. It's not an assumption. It is a group that is very vocal. All these groups are very vocal about the whole thing. And, and I agree there are different viewpoints. But I don't think this needs to be taught in our high schools. Okay. And I don't want the door opened for, okay, if you look at psychology, the, the first thing we teach a person that has been attacked is you are not a victim, you are a survivor, you are strong. That has been reversed in today's society. We're, we're touting this whole thing about how um, everyone in, in their own way is some kind of victim. And this reduces the impetus to pick yourself up and go on, as we all must when things happen to us. So would you reconsider if you could verify that the verbiage and the teachings were not victimizations, actual historical factual data that groups of people experienced? I, I, would, I would think about this if I could see the curriculum. I, I want to know what they're teaching. And this, the, the phrase at the bottom where it says, as they move chronologically from 1492 to contemporary America, was a red flag to me because of the teachings that have started that, um, that we were founded on slavery. When slavery was endemic across the world, and, and it was not a founding purpose of this nation, it was, we actually moved pretty quickly to get rid of it. And um, some, I mean, of course, there were some groups that didn't, but they lost, right? I, I don't like this. I don't like um, immersing in rich discussion of current events. I, I believe that belongs with the family. I do. And I believe that um, we already are in a lot of areas teaching civic engagement and community building. I don't think this is necessary to add to that. And um, the celebration of our, our nation's development and, and, its, and its rich diversity, that's wonderful. But I'd have to see how that was being done. 
because I've seen it done to the detriment of different groups. And there's no need to put down one group to lift another. And I, I just. That, I appreciate you answering my question. And that is valid. Nobody should feel like uh, they're stepping on somebody to get ahead. But to go back to my original question, there's no word verbiage. So on the word victimization throughout when Miss That's what I'm saying okay. about transparency. How do we know what this is going to be? Okay. That's put in front of us to vote for, and we don't know what this is going to be. Valid point. I don't like it. Yes, ma'am. We do know what it's going to be. It's clearly outlined. It's supported by state standards. The state standards, I, there are more state standards articulated that completely support this course. HSSP 1-3, evaluate the significance of past events as they relate to their own lives and the world. HSSP 2-1, analyze how context shaped and continue to shape people's perspectives. HSSP 2-2, analyze the ways in which perspective shapes recorded history. When we're talking about perspectives, we're talking about primary source documents. Your perception of this meeting tonight will be different than my perception. That does not mean that I am wrong or you are wrong. It is perception. That is what multiple perspectives is. So this course is rooted in our state standards. And when we talk about multiple, multiple perspectives and looking at the experiences of different groups in this country, it's backed up by what was approved in 2018 by our state. Thank you, Jen. Is there any further comments, questions? I, I'll, I'll tell you, to be perfectly honest, I think, it, I think it is a door to the wrong kind of teaching. And personally, I will not approve of it. I, I believe that it is an affrontment. And I, and I believe that it is harmful to our students and our families. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Ms. Ms. Underhill. Thank you. Um, I have to say that I am a sixth grade social studies teacher, so I am very familiar with the standards myself. And I do have to say that our standards are broad and they cover many, many different perspectives using both primary and secondary sources. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that they are evaluated for historical bias um, and we really try to incorporate multiple perspectives. In regard to my personal area, sixth grade, it's world religions and cultures of the Eastern Hemisphere. And there was a question about the Bible. In fact, we do cover um, you know, Christianity, the Israelites, all of that is covered along with Hinduism and Buddhism and all of those things because those things help us understand how ancient civilizations developed, how people moved around the world, and how cultures developed. So they help us not only understand others, but understand ourselves. So I just want to say that um, it is definitely within the alignment of our standards. In fact, um, you know, our standards have different areas. They have dis disciplinary skills and processes. Um, you know, everything from economics to civics, geography, um, and right within our own civics, there is, even within the sixth grade, um, a standard that says describe and apply civic virtues, including deliberative processes that contribute to the common good and democratic principles in school, community, and government. Key concepts include civility, civility respect for the rights of others, individual responsibility, respect for law, open-mindedness, critical examination of issues, negotiation and compromise, civic mindedness, compassion, patriotism, and consensus building. So it is within our framework to expose our children. Um, in regard to the comments about our literacy, I don't really understand how this course would go against our efforts toward literacy at all. In fact, I think it would greatly enhance our literacy because it really does focus on critical skill development, critical thinking development. Um, it's also a current and relevant topic. And I know um, I taught in my previous teaching career long ago, kids who were involved with the juvenile justice system. And when I brought in a curriculum that was like similar, had similar perspectives um, called teaching tolerance, that was the most engaging um, moments with those kids because they could see themselves, they could understand historical perspectives, and in some ways they could understand where they were and maybe you know how they can move forward. So from my perspective, I don't see this as trying to, like uh, teaching kids about awareness of other religions, of other things, of other perspectives, as long as we're looking at accuracy, historical bias, and bringing in multiple perspectives does not seem like a negative thing to me. It is also an elective course. 
chosen by students and parents. So I don't really understand why that is such a challenge either. So um, that is just my perspective as a sixth grade social studies teacher, as a mom, and as a member of this community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. Ms. Pingarelli. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, everybody's passion uh, this evening. Um, uh, I wanted to say thank you for Ms. Dunham for being here. You were uh, my daughter's favorite teacher uh, <laughs> of all time. Um, but in, in trying to have us approve something that is a concept and understanding the process now that we approve a concept, it goes to uh, have the curriculum uh, designed. I'm not as comfortable with that. So unless I know what the curriculum is going to say, I'm not willing to approve it. But thank you. And thank you. And yep, go ahead. And if I may, again, we could uh, approve the course in concept. Courses in our course uh, guide are not permanent. And so we could approve the concept. We could do a study session. Uh, and of course, the, that, that course of study can be re reviewed at any time. Thank you for that, Dr. Reynolds. Ms. Sarah Martinez. Thank you. To follow up on the process, what has been the process and procedures in the, historically um, with other coursework? Help, help me understand how this process for this course is different than the 132 years that we've been doing it here at Peoria. By governing board policy, we um, would like to bring curriculum to the governing board for approval. And so, um, I'm not sure if that's done in all of the past years. We are updating our policies and making sure that we are adhering to those. So um, another idea um, is to be approving our handbooks with some of those curriculum um, content or course selections in there. Thank you. And so just to reiterate, make sure I understand, because I'm trying to understand how this process for this particular class is different than how we approved let's say i know we approved in a, a few board meetings ago it, it's not so and, and also not unsimilar to how the process would work in other school districts as well so for, we go through the same process for math reading english you present a course topic and then the work begins once the board approves and we've done that in the past four years I would believe so. That's correct. Okay. So just to be crystal clear, this board has practice where we've proved curriculum, given the go-ahead go ahead for the administration to move forward, just like we're doing tonight. Yeah, and we're, we're sort of inner, right? We're, we're, we're intermixing two, two terms. One is curriculum right. and one is a course, yes. right? And we're approving it, the, con the concept for the course this evening. Perfect. And I, I was just trying to understand yeah. how we were doing it different, but the reality is that this board has approved the same process for all other courses. Is that correct? I've only been Assuming, here six months. Okay. Super, but I, I and assume I, I I've believe seen we that got, process before. We got confirmation that that's accurate. That is correct. Okay. Thank you for that. I was just trying to understand if we did something different with that. Um, I have had the privilege of speaking with Mr. Hollenbaugh and team about this con content. Uh, as an active board member, I do pride myself in doing um, my due diligence. And um, I take my role very seriously because I have the same questions and concerns that you all have, as well as my son who comes to me every day and says, do you know my classmate knows more than you, mom, about politics? And I go, what do you mean? Well, at lunch we talked about so it begged the question, what is going on on our campuses? With Dr. Reynolds' support, I did a, what you call a listening tour and asked our children, how comfortable do you feel about talking about race? Simple question. It is very clear to me that many people are uncomfortable. M many people. It is not a divide. And what I asked is, how do we help through that conversation? What do you need from us? They said, we need a skilled 
facilitator, a moderator, an educator, not somebody who's biased. So I'm going to ask um, Ms. Dunham, if you don't mind, I am a proud product of your AP Honors History class. And you've taught uh, history, please come on up and help me understand because we do have some concerns. And I want to openly discuss what the conversation looked like in regards to the content that is being considered in regards to this class. All right, well, thanks for inviting me up, and you'll probably regret this in about 30 minutes from now. But um, uh, I was very fortunate. I think it's probably, I was actually, I'm, I'm a little dumbfounded by this experience because I was excited to come here and answer maybe some questions about how this course would move forward. Um, I didn't really prepare myself for what happened tonight, but I'm, I'm really eager to talk to it. Um, quick little backstory: I have taught the nation's history for the last 29 years. Um, I have taught United States history for every single semester and year that I have taught, and I have done so proudly and enthusiastically because it is important. And it excites me to see so much civic involvement because that's kind of what this is all about. And, and it's exciting that people are, are on board with these moments to, to engage and question and become part of because that is like my ultimate job. You know, at the beginning of my class, and again, every single moment of my teaching has been in those same walls of my classroom in 323 since I was 22 at Centennial High School. And I've even had opportunities to go and, and teach other things and do other things and, and, and move into other positions, and I can't let go of what I teach. It's just that important. And, and even with all the situations that have an, unfolded recently, um, it, you know, every year it gets more important. You know, I like to tell my kids, don't tell your other teachers, but this is the most important. You know, we need to build citizens, and we need everybody to feel like they're part of this. Um, I had the brilliant opportunity to actually meet Ms. Hart. Um, I wasn't, I, I was the advanced placement history teacher for your daughter and you for many years, and it's interesting because I, I actually took a break from AP after teaching it for 20 years because it was so hard to fit in all of these brilliant and meaningful questions that kids want to ask in the process of discussing this nation's history that, believe it or not, your kids really want to be part of. And they really want to be, be engaged and empowered and they want their own American story to be valued. And, and, and you'd be surprised how kids really want to understand their story. I digress, but I had actually not had um, Ms. Hart as my student. And when Mr. Holliba said, and I have been the department chair of social studies at Centennial High School for the last 25 years as well, when he said, hey, will you come aboard? We've got a former student, and she's really passionate about trying to promote something that she has, you know, as her capstone project for her graduation, her honors um, capstone project, is really meaningful to her, and obviously, that excites me because that's really what you want is, is for people to think about where they stand in this. And then when I listened to her, I was just like, oh, I wish I had had the privilege to teach her because she's just fantastic. And the work and energy she put into this, it, it's, I'm so saddened that some of you would think that this is some sort of curriculum of victimization. And it's not. It's one of, of em, embracing and, and inspiring. And, and it, it, it's not just about one group or, or another group, you know, one of my passions for history came from my own father. You know, my dad uh, fought in Vietnam. And I remember as a young child, and, and my dad is still around today, he's an amazing person, and I reference him a lot in my classroom, and my mother too. Um, very young when they had me, and, and you know, when he talked a little bit about his history, I remember just asking the why. I wanted to know the why. And, and when I teach history, it's, it's the why that becomes important. The what is everywhere. Um, and that's why I can't let go of U.S. history. And we're not letting go of U.S. history. When you talk about the why of the United States Constitution, that's an important conversation. Why are these components added? Why did this happen? Why did that, this brilliant document that's really stood the test of time for just a little over two centuries and 30 years, you know, how that, that happened to be so, so you know, time-tested and so, so much longevity? That why is so critical. This class helps kids ask why. And the why is everything. You know, the point you get from A to B is important. But what you do to go to C from there is even more so. 
but you can't jump from A to C. You have to, you have, to have that path. And the more kids are inspired, and I, I won't directly quote you, um, Mrs. Doan, but you said, you know, they need to be encouraged. That you, you know, you talked about kids and finding that engagement and finding that, that, that purpose and that, that encouragement when you were speaking earlier. And I said, absolutely. And, and, and history and social studies is one of those few places that they can feel that. You know, when you're teaching U.S. history, and, you know, and Alexa brought in this idea of, you know, identifying identity. That's, that's not a, a scary or bad thing, and, it, and it's something that everybody should try to think about. Whether it's my Irish grandparents escaping, their great-great-grandparents escaping the potato famine and finding some sort of comfort here, to a student I just had last week that was so excited, an online student excited, this is, you know, a big deal, about finding out that her, you know, grandfather saw Cesar Chavez speak and how he talked to her endlessly at Thanksgiving about that moment. Because I had encouraged them to go out, ask your parents. You know, they had a little assignment where they had to try to engage with their grandparents since they would hopefully be seeing them or at least talking to them over the break. When you see kids that find a connection to the, the backstory of this country, and you see the enormous impact it makes on them, it changes the game. And when I heard Alexa speak about what she wanted to do with this in, in her she did so much work to make this something positive. And it saddens me to think that anybody would think that it'd be presented negative. And if I'm the one to, to pilot this, and if this gets passed, I can assure you that that is absolutely the opposite of what I want. Whether it's you know, somebody explaining their, their, their backstory as a working class member of this, of this great country, which is no less important than, than those who are the movers and shakers. The U.S. history course is there, and let me tell you, it is chock full. We have a lot to do. You know, we go back, we have to talk about our founding fathers and this brilliant institution, this, the, the, this, the strength and the bravery to create what we refer to as the American experiment, an ongoing experiment that we are all responsible for maintaining if we want to keep up the amazing things that we get from this system. And we all have a rich role in that. And the more we deny people access to being a part of this amazing system, the more divided we'll become going forward. It needs to be a celebration. You know, kids ask me, what does e pluribus unum mean on our currency? That's well, a Latin phrase. It says, from many there is one. And, and, you know, we have to live up to that idea that there's a lot of things going on here, but we come here together and we create this thing that can be better. You know, when you teach American history, you have to be compelled to teach all of it. And some things are amazing, like the Constitution. Everybody should understand that document. It's brilliant. The fact that James Madison put that document together in, in 1797 and for it to have the longevity to still guide us in 2020 is nothing but just phenomenal and, and extraordinary. And kids need to know what that, what that is. And we do and we try to do a good job and you know there's so much. But an elective like this that allows people to celebrate a people's history for them to step back and say, you know, I, I want to know the why of where, where I'm at. It doesn't have to be victimization. There's celebrations and tragedies for every group that's part of this system, this e pluribus unum that we're in. And it's really important that we acknowledge all of them. You know, and I, I find the characteristic of empathy to be among the greatest of, of humans. The idea to walk in somebody else's shoes, whether it's a soldier who crawled up on the beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944, or a person who was subject to a Japanese internment camp, even though their son was fighting the 442nd military or regiment, which was the most highly decorated of all of World War II, who was all Japanese American, by the way. Whatever that is, the only reason I've been able to stand up and teach US history for 29 years is because I look at it through the eyes of the people I'm teaching about. And it inspires me every time. If kids can somehow harness that ability to walk in each other's shoes in some capacity, what a better world we would live in, whether it's the kids who have so much or the kids who have so little. You know, even as I listen to the, the members of our community who have come here to speak, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm thinking about things through their shoes. What's, what's inspiring them to feel this way? What happened in their backstory to make them feel afraid of a course like this? Where is, where is that, that moment that made them feel this is going to be dangerous? Because that's an important question to ask. 
because we don't want them to feel like that feeling that they very sincerely, obviously, in this room have would be discounted in any way, shape, or form. And, and a course like this allows us to, to explore that. It is not, you know, the fact that she has created a chronological course where you can just go right outside and say, where did my backstory begin? You know, how, how am I part of this? If we can help ourselves answer the why, if we can promote empathy of all groups to each other, and mostly if we can stop thinking that there's one, you know, person or group or idea that has a monopoly over, their, over the value of their American story, then that's wrong. You know, we, we are on a cusp right now of doing something really good. And everybody can come in. And by no means, and if you know me as a teacher, and I, I welcome you to my classroom at any point, would there be any, you know, gumption of victimization? Let's get better. Let's, let's churn out some people who feel like they have a stakehold in this system. That they can look back and say, I have some part of this. And, and I want to move forward to, to, you know, committing to what we all should have as a collective goal to make it better. And you can't do that if you tell, you know, if you assume that it's going to be bad. You can't. Because that assumption itself is, is troubling. We need to do better. And, and I promise you, if you give the opportunity for her course to, to be practiced, it would be something that we could have all kinds of ideas and concerns of people who are afraid of this or, or concerned about what this might bring, to offer their ideas to this, to see how to make it the, I mean, it could be something really, really neat and really, really profoundly important to the students who decide to take it on. You know, my only concern is sometimes the students who, and I think we talked about this, the students who want to do this are not necessarily always the students who you want to get in there, you know? I, I get so, I mean, one of the big, you know, moments that, that I get an adrenaline rush from, as corny as that sounds from a history person, is when the kid says, I, can I bring my, my grandfather's World War II stuff? I'm like, yeah, let's go, bring it in. And, and how excited they get. You know, and when you have an opportunity to go outside of the brilliant history that I'm still committed to teaching, which is the Arizona United States History course, which is not going away, and it's chock full of important things that kids have to know. Personally, I think it's the most important class that they take, but, well, you know, I'm biased. But for them to go, like, can I spread out? Can I find out a little bit more about my backstory? Can I find out a little bit more about how this lineage went? How could we ever deny them that? This is not about winners and losers. This is not going to be about blame. This is going to be about taking a moment to help kids understand a people's history. Whether it's a working class Irish family from, you know, Boston and how they migrated to Arizona and became a ranching family, which is my family's backstory, to somebody whose family just came maybe five years ago and are trying their hand in this system that everybody wants to be part of. This is something that is, that is and I, I give you my, my you know, guarantee, this is not something that's going to work to, to promote victimization. This is not something that's going to work to, to divide. And hopefully it'll just be inspired. But I mean, I understand that you're laughing because you don't believe me, but I would encourage you to come in and listen. Yeah. Nothing means more to me than the United States history. Yeah. I have stayed there for many years. But that's. Thank yeah. you. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. And I was trying to reiterate um, some. So, so, yeah. I and I was just trying to re reiterate this: the skill, who was going to teach it, uh, and talk through some of the the, the coursework. Um, another a concern that was brought up by Miss Upton Graf Day was college course. Uh, Dr. Bell, do we have dual enrollment right now for our students, and what does that look like? We do have dual enrollment. Um, that is by course, and with our partner, our teachers that teach dual enrollment have to have a master's degree and then um, be approved through that process. So dual enrollment, um, and let me elaborate on that. When I think of dual enrollment, I'm thinking of students who are going to high school now and enrolled in college. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay, and um, what 
a, what grades are offered dual enrollment to our students? Typically, we have juniors and seniors that participate in dual enrollment. Thank you. So currently, we are practicing dual enrollment to help ease your mind in, an, uh, in a choice that students are participating in now. And would you say that content is related to what subject area? We, you mean for dual enrollment? Yes. We have dual enrollment in all of our subject areas. Thank you. So and this would just be an, an additional consideration that parents can have their students elect to participate in another dual, uh, another class. And bottom line, I was I was getting at that if these classes, types of classes, are appropriate for college course, we currently offer juniors and seniors who are taking college courses now, and and so. I'm going to finally circle back to our students who are wise because I asked them, is this type of topic appropriate for all students? And they said no, 100% on odd campus, all campuses. They said their freshmen are barely figuring out where to go to the library uh, to maneuver classwork. It's not appropriate and it should not be mandated. It should be a choice. And what I hear, what's brought to me tonight, is a choice. Um, they also said there's a level of maturity that there needs to be some prerequisites. When I look at this curriculum, I saw that U.S. history was a prerequisite. So I'm thinking through, as a student perspective, to, in order to be prepared, maturity level, junior, seniors, currently we have dual enrollment at the college levels that kids are currently participating in. And I'm going to end it. Uh, we have the skilled staff. We have w one test and learn. It's not a district-wide pilot. It is one classroom, one elective, one very skilled. I can attest, and I hope my son is in your class, by the way. Uh, and so I think through that. The last thing I think about, I'm going to bring it home to Ms. Doan's comment and my fellow governing board members, Ms. Pengarelli, Ms. Underhill, and President Sandoval. You have spoken, especially in the global pandemic, to serve the whole child. Our demographics of our district are different. Our students are now 50% white, 50% people of color. And when we think through how do we serve and evolve to serve all our students, it's giving an opportunity to discuss. Discuss the things that they like about themselves, things I don't like about my culture, things about who I am. Our students stated, I don't want a course to build consensus. I want the skill set to defend, to speak to, to articulate in a safe environment. And I remember in one board meeting, Ms. Doan, you said a very clear statement that we received some emails about that you did not want to live in fear. And it was a result of masks. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you 100%. And what I heard tonight were words like, I fear. I'm afraid, I'm concerned. To me, that's fear. And here's an opportunity where we can talk through that fear, give the board the opportunity, the study session to work through that, have the public comment. Our skilled, talented staff member has welcomed you and let's do this together. So with that, everything that I see that it's aligned to state standards, addressing parent concerns, addressing the fears of the board, you have my full support. Thank you, Ms. Sayer Martinez. And thank you to each and every one of you again um, for being vulnerable to have, you know, this courageous conversation. Um, Ms. Hart, thank you for your leadership. Um, when I really narrow my comment down to what I just said and leadership, that is part of our role as a district, as a education organization, which is developing individuals who are confident and adaptable, um, lead with others in mind, who are resilient, um, you know, and, and one of the, um, you know, really key factors of being resilient is having healthy relationships. And one of the best ways to have a healthy relationship is to have the ability to have, you know, these types of courageous conversations with one another ask questions, be able to stand in another shoe uh, to, to really just want to, to understand, to learn more. You know, when we take a look at our other role to prepare our students for the 21st century workforce, 
There are many organizations um, that our students will go to, many organizations you know, that uh, thrive on diversity because diversity does influence innovation. It does influence forward thinking. Um, and, it's, it's, and that is the best way to, to maintain relevance as an entity, as an organization, to thrive and last for many years. With that said, it's, it is, again, I, I do applaud each and every one of you, you know, for, for being vulnerable in this situation. And that's what, in my mind, how we take a look at this, this particular course um, is providing students the opportunity to, to have these conversations. Ms. Berg brought up, um, you know, some of our, our students' households, you know, may not have a, a guiding adult or an individual or a mentor to be able to have this type of dialogue uh, in, a, in a real positive fashion. Whether our students go to college or to the military or to a technical school, um, you know, we want them to be able to do so in a way that, that again, that, that they're, they're confident and adaptable. So with that said, um, you know, I, I do fully support this course um, and I, I motion that we approve Excuse the Excuse me. Curriculum. Um, I'm sorry, That's Mr. Okay. Sandoval. I have a question for Dr. Bell, if you sure. don't mind. Sure. Nope, not at all. Dr. Bell, what did you say the goal was to move to have this course and then in the future? If the board approves the concept of this course, we would bring our teams together to begin writing uh, curriculum or units. Um, that go into the course based upon state standards. For what grade levels in the future? This particular course, because of the prerequisite requirement of American history, we would have probably second semester juniors or seniors enroll in this elective course. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Ms. Dowen. President I move. Oh, okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. That uh, we approve 12.2, which is the curriculum and instruction new course course change proposal as presented. President Sandoval, I second. Ms. Contra, we have a motion by myself and a second by Ms. Seja Martinez. Uh, board members, please cast your votes. President Sandoval. Yes, ma'am. I've had some issues with my computer. I'm logging back on, so can we do a voice vote? Um, absolutely, yep. Ms. Contra, can you run us through a voice vote, please? Yes. Mrs. Pingarelli? Nay. Mr. Sandoval? Yes. Mrs. Stone? Absolutely not. Mrs. Seha Martinez? Yay. Mrs. Underhill? Yes. Motion passes three to two. Thank you, board members. I'll be looking for somewhere else to send my kids. Okay, moving on to 12.3, policy GCQC, liquidated damages. Dr. Carter Davidson, welcome, sir. President Sandoval, members of the board, Dr. Reynolds, um, stand today to support the conversation regarding liquidated damages in regards to policy GCQC that is titled resignation of professional staff members. If you recall, the board voted to remove liquidated damages um, right at, at the end of June through December 31st. As we consider contract and contract language for our certified staff and our administrators, I need to get additional guidance from the governing board on whether we continue to um, have that portion of the policy GCQC on hold or if we begin to uphold that um, come January 1 and then what that might do for our contract language, language for the next school year. So I'm here to answer any questions. I do believe you've seen some data um, that has come through uh, Ms. Contra that talks about where we are with resignations of certified staff. and. Um, Certainly here to facilitate or answer any questions you have in order to make a decision tonight. Okay. Dr. Davison, we do have public comment uh, tied to the slide items. Yes, sir. Ms. Burke, if you can pause for a sec, just to allow this gentleman to uh, cleanse the podium. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Ms. Trina Burke. Good evening again, President Sandoval, members of the board. As president of the Peoria Education Association, I'm going to ask that you once again continue to suspend um, the liquidated damages. I've been fighting for a very long time to get rid of them completely. I don't think they're actually helpful, and I don't think they accomplished the goal that you were hoping that they were going to accomplish. Especially at this time, with everything that we're going through and the uncertainties and things that are happening this year, charging teachers or charging staff to leave their contract um, and the amount that we're charging them is more than I, it took me a really long time teaching to even make that much of a paycheck. Um, I, I, it's absurd at this point. We need to just get rid of them completely. We need to suspend them fully forever. So I do support at least suspending them. We need to suspend them forever. But let's at least start with this year. If you're not willing to do that, let's suspend them for the rest of the year. There's already teachers who are very uncertain. Um, I don't want the rush of teachers to quit by December 31st because they know that the charges might come back January 1st. So let's just suspend, get rid of them completely. They're not accomplishing what we want them to accomplish. If we want to retain teachers, then let's work on creating an environment that makes people want to stay here. And we can do that through other means besides charging money to quit and to leave your job. Um, as a teacher, honestly, I don't want a teacher next door to me that doesn't want to be here and is only staying because of the, the, the fee that they're going to incur. Teaching is a very tough job. And if you're staying because you're gonna be charged more than a paycheck to leave, um, number one, now we're asking people to work for two weeks literally with no pay because we're gonna remove that money from their paycheck. Um, it's, it's not accomplishing. Let's work on the working conditions that are gonna make Peoria desirable to stay and actually retain teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Berg. Dr. Davidson. All right, let's uh, board comments, questions for Dr. Davidson. Ms. Stone? Okay. Uh, Ms. Sarah Martinez? Uh, sure, I'll start us off. Uh, thank you, Dr. Davidson. Mm -hmm. My favorite policy, GCQC. Uh, I agree. I don't like the policy, but my fellow governing board members have uh, spoken to it so, and have granted a suspension, and I would be... Uh, interested in entertaining another suspension for a short period of time uh, for the new board to discuss what the policy will look like to do from January 1st to what's end of contract, June 30th. Mm -hmm. So I would be uh, interested in entertaining that vote and then let the new board decide. Right. Thank you for that. Ms. Pangarelli? Well, we have talked about this quite a bit. Um, <laughs> it has come up. Numerous times, uh, my opinion hasn't changed. Um, this is one instance that I know I will be different from you uh, this evening. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, I believe a contract uh, should be upheld. Um, I'm a at-will employee. Uh, I can go in and lose my job any time. Um, uh, and just, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but if if the teacher signs a contract, uh, we are obligated to pay for that contract, to have them the entire time. Even if they were to go to a different school, a different grade level, we have a commitment. Um, President Sandoval, members of the board, Ms. Pingarelli, when a employee, teacher, or administrator signs a contract, yes, ma'am, that contract is for a year, essentially. And okay. um, they are our employee and are subject to work, uh, depending upon the needs of the district. So it's not just always for one location, but it is for that school right. year. Okay, so if we get rid of liquidated damages, then um, uh, only the district is obligated to uphold the contract. One could one can certainly look at it that way. Okay, well, I'm I'm not going to change the board's minds, uh, so um, I'm going to vote as I have in the past. But thank you very much. Thank you for the data. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you, Ms. Pingerly, Ms. Underhill. Um, I concur with Ms. Seha Martinez and that we should definitely extend it through this contract year and then we can reconvene with our new board members and um, go over it again. Thank you. I can go ahead and go, Ms. Down. Okay. Um, knowing that the, the ask is an extension of the suspension of this policy, the the premise still exists as to why we suspended it in the first place. 
So, um, you know, I, I do agree, you know, we can you know, suspend it for the, the remainder of the um, uh, contract year, which Dr. Davis, you said was end of June, end of June, June. is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, so I, I do absolutely support Ms. Ann Martinez, Ms. Underhill, uh, uh, and the, uh, in extending this, uh, this suspension until that time frame. Thank you. Ms. Stone? All. How many, um, does anybody know how many um, teachers we've had leave and break their contract this year so far? Yes, ma'am. Uh, President Sandoval, members of the board, Ms. Doan, uh, what we know from the time in which the board chose to suspend that portion of the policy um, just through the beginning of this week, we've had 70 um, teachers that have chosen to break their contract for a variety of reasons. With that said, policy GCQC, if you recall, has four reasons in which mm -hmm. a person could break their contract and not have liquidated damages. So when you remove those people, Ms. Doan, it comes to be 38 individuals who um, did take advantage of um, the suspension uh, and did not get charged for liquidated damages. Okay. Can you answer me with, without um, breaking any privacy issues? Were any of those related to COVID-19? Ms. Doan, I would uh, probably say the majority of those 38 were in regards to people's perceptions of fear of relationship to COVID-19. We, we've had a lot of conversations with individuals who um, did not want to fulfill their contract based on the current pan pandemic. Um, okay, and just, um, can I ask for your personal opinion? Mm -hmm. Do you think any of those will be back once the pandemic has quieted? Ms. Doan and Mr. President Sandoval, members of the board, and I'll, I'll use some of the uh, comments from Ms. Berg this evening. I believe that when we focus on a quality workplace environment that includes excellent mitigation strategies, uh, things that we've been doing, uh, and when uh, perhaps uh, there is a, um, uh, you know, a, a shot perhaps or some medicine or something that does uh, alleviate the virus, I do believe we'll see some of those former employees back with us. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Stone. Dr. Davidson, any other further comments, questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. So President Sandoval, as we end this evening, I um, would need a motion with um, the way in which you would like me to move. President Sandoval. I move to waive temporarily liquidated damages from January 1st to June 30th contract year. Is that the Second. correct date? Oh, sorry. Yes. For administrators, Ms. Sam Martinez, it'd be through June 30th. For our teaching staff, it'd be through May 22nd, okay. but yes. So let me just make sure I have the motion correct. Uh, I move to waive liquidated damages as it currently stands for the remainder of this school year. Is that correct? That'd be fair. Okay. Second. Ms. Contra, we have a motion by Ms. Sam Martinez and a second by Ms. Underhill. Board members, please cast your votes. Motion passes, 3-2. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. Board members, I'd like to request a uh, just a quick 10-minute recess, please. Thank you.
What's that? Well, I did, but I wanted to make sure I did.
Yeah. Community board members, thank you for the, uh, the brief pause. All right, ladies and gentlemen, board members, moving right along. We are moving on to 12.4, discussion and consideration of instructional models for beginning of second semester. And this is being presented by the entire COVID task force team, uh, Mr. Gay. We do have public comment, um, so board members will pause after the district's presentation. President Sandoval, members of the governing board, Dr. Reynolds, colleagues and visitors, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this evening. Ms. Please. Mr. Gay, I apologize. I'm going to just ask you to pause for just one second. I want to give everybody a quick update. Uh, Ms. Pingarelli had to run, um, so we'll be uh, finishing the rest of the board meeting uh, w without her. Thank you, Mr. Gay. Certainly. Uh, the purpose of this presentation this evening is to, and the outline, is to uh, do the following. First, Mr. Moss is going to present health metrics, uh, the current data as of this morning, actually. He's also going to present some additional uh, uh, data and analyses that he's done that will help us with our understand our current situation and projections a little better than we've been able to in the past. Then I will provide a very brief uh, recap of the information presented by administration and discussed by the governing board at the December 1st uh, board study session on plans for both in-person and uh, virtual teaching and learning models for the second semester. And finally, Dr. Reynolds will offer remarks to introduce the board's dis uh, discussion and consideration of options for instructional models to be used as we return for the second semester. Mr. Moss, if you will. Oh, you're over there. We'll have to just play quickly. There we go. paper all wet. It's uh, not the one I want. Go back. Um, anyway, um, you got to miss my, uh, President Sandoval, members of the board, you got to miss my uh, uh, mascot that I got to put. They made me, they made right. me redo, they made me redo my uh, PowerPoint. I had to take my mascot and put him on the front page of this new one. So, um, Again, we're going to provide an update for you of our metrics we get from the uh, county on a, every Thursday morning. We have information. I have some new information. I even received at 2 o'clock this afternoon when they updated a couple things. In addition, I have a couple of other additional new pieces of information that we can provide for you that also are provided through the county website. So um, we click to our first slide, and uh, these are the three benchmarks that we've seen in the past. Um, you can see we had a, a, an increase and have had an increase in the number of cases. And again, for those who first listening first time, cases is the number of cases per 100,000 people within the, that live within the district. Uh, the percent positive is the number of uh, first positive tests of all the tests given to people within the district. And the COVID-like illness is our hospitals reporting the number of people who report uh, either COVID-like or flu-like uh, illnesses. Uh, when they check into the first in, in the first time, uh, we did have an increase again from 321 to 369, 10.9 to 15.5, and 7.79.1. Uh, the colors based upon the county: uh, red being substantial spread, a yellow being a moderate spread, and, and we've talked about this before. Um, I took out a couple of slides that we normally provide. One of those slides I normally provide is a history lesson, but I think that's, we, we, you know, we know it's been going up for the last five or six weeks. So I wanted to in, give you a little, a couple of other pieces of information that we have now. This one we talked about last Wednesday or last Tuesday when we had our uh, board study session for the first time. This is um, information on a graph that we get from Maricopa County. And what this represents is each bar represents the number of COVID cases that are 
tied to that single day. In other words, when you look between 1128 and 125 down there at the end, you can track essentially how many cases were, were uh, approved or found or identified, reported on that day. The black line or dotted line is essentially a seven day rolling average of those numbers. And so you can see how our seven day rolling average has gone along. Now, as we've talked about in the past, our benchmarks are always 13 days behind, right? So we receive on Thursday, it actually is information that was a week before the Thursday, the Friday, a week before the ones we get the information. So what it allows us to do is to take those benchmarks and place them on this graph, right? So example, when we look at three weeks ago, our information is actually on information reported from 1114. So that would be our numbers we would get at that date, our last week, and now our current ones we got today were essentially from that place right there, okay? We do this because it gives us essentially a peak in terms of what's coming next, but it also gives us a, a peak in terms of where we started. And again, I think it always is uh, good to take data and give you a contextual information in terms of how it relates to different time periods that we made decisions. And an example would be we started school, right, on, uh, we sent kids back to school on 919 and those, those were the, the uh, uh, benchmarks on that date, okay? As we look at this graph, the piece that it tells me is obviously our numbers are getting bigger. And as we look at this graph and someone were to ask me what's gonna happen next week, Right, I would look seven days in advance and I would tell you that that is gonna be where the numbers are gonna exist. To give you an example, uh, the total number of cases in the three, 369 is 2,472 as a rolling average. The rolling average next, next Thursday will be 3,304. So I don't, I think the, really the statement I wanna make to you is I don't believe that the numbers will go down I believe those numbers will go up next week across the board in all of the number, all the, the benchmarks that were received. Okay, this, the next slide is a new piece of information that I want to present to you, and I realize that it's very difficult to read. Okay, but what this is is this is the distribution of the age groups who are catching or who are reporting the COVID-19 by each age group, by each week. So each of those bars represents a, a grade level, or excuse me, an age group, and you can see those age groups along the bottom, zero to five, six to 12, 13 to 18, all the way across, and you can see that the, the numbers that are graphed all together are essentially the number of cases that existed during that week. So essentially you can see how many cases in each, each age group by each week. Now obviously it's very difficult to read, and uh, and so I pulled out some of the data. Well, which data did we pull out? I wanted to pull out the information that was related to our students. So we pulled out the six to 12 year olds and we pulled out the 13 to 18 year olds. But before we do that, I wanna call your attention to the two big humps there in the middle of the graph. The one that runs from 531 until 816 and the one that runs from about 920 and the one that we're currently in, you can see that cases are rising as we currently exist. And so I took that information and I pulled out the information for grade for the six through 12 year olds and the 13 through 18 year olds. And I graph those separately. Six through 12 would be first grade through sixth grade, probably first through sixth or seventh. And 13 is probably seven through uh, high school. So what we have here is essentially the, the number of cases, right, on each of those age groups over a time period from 531, encompassing both of those large increases that we have in data for the last six months or so. And that little blue line represents the six through 12 year olds, and it is an exponential smoothing number that works with that, and it's a statistical process that's an exponential smoothing that kind of gives you an estimated uh, line in terms of where do you think the line is going. Obviously there's some that are above and some that are below, but in general it kind of gives you some general direction in terms of what you think is going to happen. The, the red line represents our group of students who are 13 through 18 year olds, and so as you can see, even in the worst times between 531 and, and 815 or whatever, when our highest next highest area, we've already exceeded those numbers 
on a weekly basis. We've already exceeded those numbers currently. Okay, um, This process and these numbers, and I can just give you some general ideas, some general ideas of the numbers. Uh, the, that low blue point down there in the bottom left is 68 cases. The current number we have is 759 cases at the upper top right in the blue. The low left for red is 134. The top right is 1441. And the information that I received today, that number actually goes to 2106. I got this at 2 o'clock this afternoon. 2106 for 13 through 18 year olds and 1212 for the 6 through 12 year olds. So the bottom line says our numbers, and again, we talk about the increases that are taking place across the uh, whole uh, society, but we can also see that it, we are getting more cases in our numbers of students, the, the ages of our students that we have in Maricopa County. Now, as a, as a data person, one of the things that I look at, and, and I looked at the next step, is I wanted to say, well, of course, if the numbers are going up and they're equally distributed, our numbers will go up. But the second question then is whether or not these groups are becoming more a part of the total. In other words, are they growing faster than the total? Are they becoming more, more part of the number of students or number of people who are reporting COVID? And so if I take a look at the next graph, this is a, again, a scatter plot with a trend line. And it really talks about the idea that way back in the, the blue line represents our six through 12 year old students. And you can see that way back in, to, in 531 or in that lower left, that it was approximately 2% of the population of the, of the people, 2% of the people who had the, the uh, reporting COVID were between the ages of six and 12. Right now, if you were to take a look at that number and you look at the far right, you can see that number has jumped to about approximately four percent and in actuality uh, this week it was actually 5.4 percent again that was part of the information I received on at about two o'clock the 13 year olds you can see rise from five percent to around eight percent over time and in reality this week it was 11.4 when the information we just received so I look at it and I think it makes a couple of um, comments that we have to really talk about one is if I add a number you're really looking at 2% of, I don't have the room, you're actually looking at, in 531, you're looking at 2% of 2,100 total cases. Currently, you're looking at 4% of 16,000 total cases on a weekly basis. So not only are you getting more, but you're getting more of the same, a uh, more relative percentage for our group of students. And that leads me to my next, and I haven't done this, but I wanna make sure that, that there's no misunderstanding in terms of what we wanna talk about. And so here's some trends and observations we make from this data. First is the district benchmarks will continue to increase. They will be higher next week. The number of cases for our six to, thir six to 12 year old and 13 to 18 age groups will also continue to increase. More students will catch the COVID in the next couple week, in the next week. And finally, not only are they catching more, but they will have a greater percentage of the total cases. In other words, they will catch it faster than some of the other age populations that are uh, re represented in the information. And so it, it, it leads us to conversations about what to do. And this is why we're here to talk about what do we do with students in the, in the future. Now, the last, the last two pieces of information are information that were provided or asked for by the governing board. And so we want to present these. And again, this is the first time that we have offered this information. I caution you a little bit with looking at much of this data because this data is uh, from a data scientist position is somewhat um, the, the validity and the reliability is somewhat suspect. First of all, it is uh, difficult that we are reporting the information because we have disincentivized some of our families from reporting. In other words, if there is a consequence, if I report I am quarantined for 10 days, we get some difficulties in terms of underreporting. The second is that if we depend on this data too much, in two weeks while we're gone on holiday break, these numbers will all go to zero because we won't 
collect any of this data during that time while we're on break. The third is that it's just a snapshot of time and a sample of the number of kids or the number of kids who actually have, the, have reported COVID to us who have come in contact with our students. In other words, they've been at school. And so those are the information that we keep. It's not about the number of total number of cases or those things. It's about how many have been at school that have exposed other students or are, have been in our campuses. So it's active cases. It's the number of kids, not active cases, but it's the number of cases that where we have a student who is on campus and has been exposed to other students. Okay. So I caution you to take a look. And again, it's, it's not a, it is good data to have. It is something to look at. But at the same time, I caution you that there is, there is lots of um, potential for misinterpretation from this, from this data. The next piece you asked for is, some, is related to athletics and to some of the things and some of the other areas. These are the number of athletes, marching band, and coaches who have been directly infected. And we went back to look through each of the things to see who was impacted in that. Um, this, and this is from August 17th forward, by the way. But I look at this, and I first have to tell you that these are not additional cases to the ones we showed you on the, on the previous page, but they are a subset of that information. So our total number is still 352. It's just another way of pulling out the information and looking at it in a different way, a different, um, a different breakout, if you will, of the people who were there. It also is the fact that this kid got the, uh, this athlete, we have 43 athletes who got the, the COVID. We don't make any, any statement that the student got it at, 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 at athletics. He may have gotten it in math class or may have gotten it on the weekend or may have gotten it whatever. He just happens to be on the basketball team or on the baseball team or the football team or whatever it is. So we need to be careful that says those are not the athletes that they got it in athletics. They may have gotten it who knows where. And in fact, we probably don't know where because we can't track that in that, in that case. And so um, we provide you with this information. It's additional information that we talked about. And so we, um, yeah, I guess in general, I would tell you that uh, the, the data is moving in the wrong direction, which we see every day in the news, in the places, in wherever you want to look. Okay? Thank you, Mr. Moss. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Moving on to the second item in our outline for this evening. Given that recent uptick in the COVID health metrics, which as you've seen has been going on for some weeks now, Dr. Reynolds had asked me several weeks ago as the COVID task force leader to shift our planning to focus also on the potential for returning from winter break in virtual mode. So on December 1st, the governing board held a special study session at which one of the agenda items was a presentation by staff and a board discussion around plans for supporting teaching and learning as we return for the second semester. As part of that uh, presentation that staff gave, uh, Mr. Moss once again uh, gave a health data update and that data was as of the 26th of November. He also gave some additional projection analyses. He commented also that Maricopa County was not recommending a return to all virtual learning until all three benchmarks have reached the red zone or the red point, red benchmark, if you will. Missouri also gave uh, part of the presentation and she presented on uh, our legal requirement uh, from the state for providing on-site support uh, should we be back in virtual uh, learning mode. And she talked about the city of Peoria, some uh, potential location changes, and focused on uh, our plans for all of that work with a high priority on special education, self-contained services, and delivery of free meals to students during the break. Moving on, Dr. Bell um, presented information on our uh, academic preparation should we have to return to school virtually. Much of the focus of that presentation or those preparations is a result of lessons learned from our virtual learning experience, experiences during the spring and virtual instruction uh, early in the fall semester. There also was discussion regarding alternatives we have and are considering for online learning platforms as our contract with virtual Florida schools reaches its expiration point. Mr. Duguid, 
uh, summarize plans for social emotional learning and supports for students in need. The primary focus of that work is on utilizing our social workers and social work interns to reach out to the approximately 1,600 students that are either not registered or are substantially disengaged for some reason from learning. Mr. Duguid also mentioned plans for curbside delivery of breakfast and lunch meals at all sites. Finally, I presented our plans for elementary schools to prepare to reissue laptops and internet hotspots to families that need them for virtual learning. High school students, as you know, who checked out devices in August were allowed to keep them throughout the fall semester, so there won't be a lot of additional demand at the high school level. I commented that we should have sufficient devices to support the expected demand and are issuing additional devices in preparation to do just that. Finally, I want to make three concluding points. If I can get my notes here. On the COVID task force, we continue to plan for multiple learning and support scenarios as we aim to be fully prepared or even over prepared, prepared to return for second semester. The second point, it is it's essential that we communicate very clearly with families and staff as soon as possible to enable preparation, their preparation, during the holiday break. And finally, the governing board certainly has multiple options it can consider and we would be prepared to support. And that said, Dr. Reynolds, if you'd like to uh, take the next step. Well, thank you, Mr. Gay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moss, for your presentation, your updates. We always appreciate uh, the, the data you provide and, and the expertise that, uh, that you bring to us. Uh, as we are all aware, and as this board is aware, Peoria Schools uh, has taken the approach that we are going to uh, use all the mitigation strategies at our disposal. We are going to work hard to keep our schools open to in-person learning. And I, I just want to thank everyone in our community for uh, doing the hard work, doing uh, your part, and uh, making sure that, that we have been able to remain open to in-person learning uh, up until now. As we enter our holiday break, we have a few challenges we face with our current direction. Uh, if you remember back in August, uh, our governing board uh, voted to use the three benchmarks uh, that the state has provided. Uh, over break, we face, a, a, again, a couple of challenges uh, in dealing with, uh, in dealing with th uh, this pandemic. First of all, the planning and implementing uh, that takes place if we need to change gears. Uh, can be difficult while our teams are away for, for two weeks. Also, communicating with staff and families uh, and students can be uh, a challenge for us as families are uh, kind of unplugging a little bit and, and focusing on other things. Uh, and again, our, our staff is gone. And then lastly, uh, the, the challenge uh, that we may face as we come back from uh, our holiday break is uh, what we saw in the data, and that is a potential uh, increase uh, to our uh, data as we come off from break and, uh, uh, and kids rejoin the, the classroom. Uh, as you also saw in Mr. Moss's presentation, it is now likely, uh, again, we, we can't uh, be absolutely sure, but it is likely uh, that we will enter uh, the red uh, in all three of our benchmark, all three of our benchmarks, uh, while we are on break, and of course that then uh, creates a challenge for us. Uh, so tonight, we, our team, needs to know uh, how the board wants us to open for the second semester for learning. We have some options uh, that we can consider. We can uh, open, as the benchmarks tell us, as you voted in August, we could potentially do. Uh, a kind of soft opening uh, where we invite some or all uh, of our students to virtual learning uh, uh, for a short period of time. But if it's the will of the board, we need to take action uh, on how to open for January 4th and then uh, how we're going to readdress uh, our metrics as we come back in January. President Sandoval, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. Uh, Mr. Gay, Mr. Moss, thank you. We do have public comments, uh, so coming to board, if we can uh, uh, pause our question and comments um, uh, to after listening to the public.
So the first public comment comes from Christine. Uh, Captain, is that correct? Capitana, sorry. Um, okay, hi. I've never been to one of these things before, so this is pretty, pretty new. Um, I'm just coming today, I appreciate you listening to me, as just a concerned mom. Um, I have a kindergartner and a second grader that go to Park Ridge, and I'm, this concerns us a lot. This, you say invite us to virtual learning like it's a good thing. Virtual learning is not a good thing. It did not work out for us. Um, the tools that you guys say that you have in place for us are ineffective. They're, um, they're just not, they don't work. Asking my kindergartner to work on a laptop and navigate through three different programs in one day is unrealistic. Um, and then to have one of them start at 8, one of them start at 8.30, one of them go to from Ford Virtual to iReady to Raz Kids to God knows whatever else they were doing um, is not only difficult for them, but it's very frustrating for us. I'm a firefighter. My wife's a nurse. We work between 12 to 48 hour shifts. To come home and, and now ask us to now become teachers um, is not fair. We were not educated for this. I have no idea how to teach my child how to read. Um, I cannot explain to my third grader why two is spelled three different ways. I, I don't <laughs> understand and I don't get it. Um, so that's better left to the professional, professionals. Gruenmeyer is fantastic. Lyons is, is fabulous. Everybody that we've run into as far as teachers, they're better equipped for this. We are not. And um, I understand all the, the pretty bar graphs you have and, and the scatter whatever, but show me a graph that, that shows that they're not falling behind in education. Show me a graph that they're not being hurt by not being able to go to school and socialize and learn how to deal with other children and communicate with each other. Show me that, because that's what I'm concerned about. I don't, I don't care about your benchmarks and your red and your yellow and all that. This affects my kids. Show me that. Show me how it doesn't hurt them. This virtual stuff does not, does not work. It hurts them more than it helps them. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment is from Ms. Trina Berg. Good evening again, President Sandoval, members of the board. Um, again, as president of the Peoria Education Association, I wanted to do a quick temperature check with teachers and just kind of with my members, I should say, and see kind of what the, the overall feeling was. Um, we know that learning in person is the best way to learn. We're teachers, we know this, we understand this. But we also understand that the virtual and the back in person and then being quarantined and then you're back again is also very disruptive to both the students, the teachers, the classroom, the environment and everything else. Um, we saw the spike after we came back, a little bit from Halloween. We saw the spike especially when we came back from Thanksgiving because we're human and we want to socialize, we want to be around our families and we totally understand that. We're concerned when we come back from winter break that we're going to see another very large spike. The data is already showing this that we're going to increase our metrics. We adopted the metrics, we said we were going to follow the metrics. If the metrics go red, we're going to be virtual. This is a community spread issue. So this is like what's happening in the community and we are not responsible directly for what's happening in the community. The community is responsible for what's happening in the community. The quick temperature check that I did with members showed that about 80% of the respondents would like us to come back in some way, shape or form to a virtual environment for at least the first part, the first two weeks or so after we come back. Give everyone a chance to see their families, quarantine again. If they're ill, they can, they're gonna be ill while we're virtual instead of coming back and then spreading it through the schools or at least bringing it to schools and then causing a bunch of kids to have to quarantine. Um, as a high school teacher, we're changing. We're not like I'm going to be. I'm not going to be dual modality teach, teaching anymore. When we come back, I'm going to have an in-person class, and my online kids are going to be in a separate class. So having to quarantine after we come back from break for our high school kids, which have the biggest increase in cases based on our data, um, it's not going to be an easy transition. They're not going to just going to be able to pop into Teams on this in the same class that they're already in with all their same peers. 
it's, it's going to be a different environment um, for high school kids across the board. Elementary kids are being shuffled around. A lot of them are going to be starting possibly a new teacher after break because of the way we're switching things around at semester. So to come back and then possibly have to leave again and then quarantine or the metrics get hit and then we have to go virtual again, that kind of transition is going to be harder for everyone than just coming back, planning right now a month in advance, approximately less than a month, three weeks in advance, to just be virtual and know that we're going to be virtual for the first two weeks or whatever. So thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Berg. The next public comment is from Ms. Heather Camarada. Uh, good evening, I'd like to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address the board. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for your service during this difficult time in trying to navigate what's best for our children. My daughter is currently a first grader at Paseo Verde Elementary School. We love our school, we love our teachers and administrators at Paseo Verde, and we believe they are doing an amazing job. I stand before you on behalf of my daughter and our family's concerns about her education. We completed the first month of the school year virtually and have also endured a 14-day quarantine due to COVID exposure at school. I have an underlying health condition and we are concerned for protecting our elderly parents, so COVID does concern us. However, I am equally worried about my daughter's education in these important early years for her. She's currently le learning to read and this is such an important, important time for her. My daughter has told me on more than one occasion that she loves school, but she hates it on the computer. I've noticed changes in her behavior during the period we were learning from home in terms of frustration level and acting out. I hope that you consider and remember our youngest, most vulnerable learners when deciding future learning options. Please consider continuing to offer an in-person option for them, even if the majority of students must transition back to virtual learning. I was very appreciative in the fall that when we returned to school, K-2 to came back first before the rest of the grades and hope that you will consider, to con um, consider this an option. In closing, I want you to know I'm here tonight in what I believe to be the best interest of my child. I will always do everything in my power to advocate for her and will do whatever it takes during this time to make sure that she is successful. I work full time but have flexible work arrangements to allow me to be with her when needed for virtual education. So I'm not here in a position that I don't believe the science, I, I get it. I'm not, I'm fortunate enough to not be in fear of losing my job and be able to still assist her. But my utmost concern is to ensure she receives a quality education and I feel that she is best served and happiest when attending school in person. None of this is about me. I'm here for her. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next public comment is from Ms. Devin Updegraff Day. All right, so my final comment. So um, obviously we all want our community and teachers and of course our students safe. No one ever wants to feel like they're being sacrificed and of course I would never want teachers or staff to feel like they're sacrificing their well-being for their students. But remember, teachers are adults and they have the ability to walk away from the field of education if they are uncomfortable. Students, however, do not have that choice to simply walk away from the education. Students are failing, have failed virtual. My students failed virtual, literally failed virtual. I pulled them because it, I pulled them to get them in person. Simple as that. Um, when kids struggle and they get behind, they lose confidence. They lose the enjoyment of school. You get behind, it's hard to catch up. That's going to increase higher dropout rates. Now, prior to COVID, the U.S. high school dropout rate was 1.2 million students every year. That's 25% or one student every 26 seconds, or 7,000 a day. At what point do we put our child's well-being before an adult? According to Dr. Jean Twin, she's the author of a book, iGen, she wrote this prior to course COVID, so this is unrelated, but states that teens that spend more time on screen activity are more likely to be unhappy, and those, of course, who spend more time with non-screen activities, such as school classrooms, are more likely to be happy. There is no exception. Demographics are irrelevant. Her research went on to find 
that teens who spent more than three hours a day, that's it, three, actually it starts at even two, are 35% more likely to have one suicide risk factor. That's huge. Now we are living in a world that seems to be centered around safetyism and fear, and that is extremely disheartening. There is not an expert around the world that was recommending school closures, not one. The district cannot allow fear to override data and expert guidance. This board states it's following health guidelines, benchmarks, and medical expert panel. Yet a decision to return to virtual would ignore top pediatricians, top pediatric psychologists around the world who repeatedly state schools must remain open. Um, now, I had mentioned, I guess I had heard someone that one of the PowerPoints that kids would be catching it faster upcoming. Uh, so I'd be curious where you got that data because I haven't seen anything that suggests that. Um, when we talk about positive cases, why are we not talking about hospitalizations? That's what's relevant. How many students, teachers that have been, um, have been positive have been hospitalized or even required medical treatment at all? So we had to go to the doctor's office. That is relevant. We're not talking about that. Um, we can't, don't use HIPAA because it's not pertinent to the situation I'm in medical. So you can't play this HIPAA card. We're not talking about personal. We're talking about numbers and stats. Um, so we do need that data. and We are entitled to that data. Now, every research study that I have read suggests that um, being at home, I'm not transmitting the virus. OK. Thank you. Next public comment regarding this line item is from Ms. Christina Rogers. Hello, and thank you once again for listening to all of us. Um, I am coming from, I, my child is at Sunrise Mountain High School. He's a sophomore. He has an IEP. And we were online. He got no assistance for his IEP, none whatsoever. Their suggestion to me was to go and take him to the library where he gets to sit there and once again be online, just like he is at my home, with security guards making sure that he stays on task. That is not helping my child. My child has never failed a class from kindergarten till now until we went virtually. He is failing. He is now back in school. We finally are getting him caught back up. He is finally passing his classes once again. And my fear is, is that we're gonna go on break, you guys are gonna close down again, and he's going to start a new semester, new classes behind again. It's very discouraging for our children to have to keep catching up. And it's easy to say, sit there for eight hours on a class, and you know, and he, he's, a, he's a boy, but to, I can't imagine having a kindergarten, a first grade or whatever, when I can't even get my 15 year old son to sit there and actually learn. This is a total wasted year for my son, totally wasted year. And my daughter, whose friends, she's at Liberty, she has friends that are online and she's like, mom, they all cheat all the ones that are at home, they're all cheating. He's like, she's like, they all are cheating. She's like, they're not gonna get anywhere in life. Our children need to be in school. And just like her with the data of all that, I'd love to know the hospitalizations. I would love to know where those numbers actually go. Is it like the flu? We go, we're, we're sick, we come back, no problem. Because 40% of them have no symptoms. And the statistics of recovery is 99.9% two percent for 49 and below for ages 49 and below 99.92 percent recover and we've closed down our schools isolated our children and you know the other thing that's really sad is 2500 flu cases last year we had 2500 flu cases reported last year at this time you know how many we have now 112 where did they all go so those covid numbers are now our flu numbers, that's not fair. Because most of our children, my kids have had COVID, their friends have had COVID, and you know what, it lasted 24 hours, they were done. Their friends had no symptoms, but stayed home for 14 days because she had nothing, because she was exposed by her family. 
We have got to do better for our children. Our children deserve better. We are the adults in their lives. They deserve Time. better. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Next public comment comes from Ms. Becky Smith. Hello, thank you. Um, I have a lot of notes, so I probably won't get to everything. But um, basically, I guess, do the risks outweigh the costs that we're seeing? Um, we're seeing spikes in kids killing themselves, and that is tragic. You have a greater risk of our kids dying in the car accident than from COVID. So to stop their education for something that's such a minimal risk doesn't make any sense to me. Um, we also look at the US death rates over the past five years, and we're on track to be lower or the same as the past five years. So how are our US death rates on track to be the same, if not lower, in a pandemic? That makes no sense. So it's just basically, do the risks outweigh the costs? I, I personally don't think they do. I don't think it's worth destroying kids' education, their, their social life, their self-esteem, and the risk that um, of them taking their lives. We've had kids take their lives on Zoom calls um, in front of their whole class. We've had kids be exposed to inappropriate content through people hacking and putting inappropriate content during live classes. So there's, there's too many risks for this. Um, I've watched videos of top pediatricians stating they would have no problem allowing their kids go back to school. They would have no concern because it, this does not affect children. Um, it's not dangerous for children. And if masks work, why are they not working? Uh, everywhere I go, people are wearing masks. Every kid in school is wearing masks, but our numbers keep climbing, keep climbing, keep climbing. And I don't want to hear that it's the few who don't wear masks or the, the socialization on the weekends, because that is so small. You have, you, so many people are, are, are doing what they're supposed to do, but yet numbers keep going up. And no one wants to talk about, could it be cross-contamination? The general public is not versed on you don't put your mask on a table. You don't put your mask on the floor. You don't shove it in your purse with your dirty money and your keys. So we're, we're probably experiencing cross-contamination. I don't think kids are responsible enough to not have their masks be filthy and dirty and cross-contaminating everything in the school. But that's a whole other subject because I, I don't feel they're working. Um, but you have um, this year 522 kids ages 5 to 14 have committed suicide and 42 in the same age group have died of corona death. So it doesn't seem to be making sense what we're doing. Um, you're also, you're watching the death of public schools. You guys are all public school teachers. I was a public school teacher. You're forcing people to charters and to private schools because every time a, a school, public school closes, people are running to find a charter that's still open. They're running to a, a private school that they can pay for and still have their kids in school. So um, I don't even understand the point in these tests because I have friends who their kids supposedly were exposed, they went and got a negative COVID test, they still weren't allowed to go back to school. So what's the point of getting tested if you're gonna test negative and still not be able to go back to school? Uh, German neurologist, Marguerite, I won't, I'll butcher her name because she's German, but she is a neurologist. She said, oxygen deprivation is real. You're slowly killing brain cells by wearing masks. So we're doing this to our children. Time. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Next public comment comes from Ms. Heather Rooks. Um, so every research study I've read suggests are getting at home and they're not transmitting the virus. It is extremely compliant to mask face covering. Kids are doing what, they, what is asked of them, including mine. Uh, Let's see, so in Wisconsin, um, 8,000 students, um, 17 schools, five districts, 80% majority um, thought to be staying equal to home. I'm probably butchering her data, but we yeah. we're not allowed to speak longer than three minutes, which I find outrageous. Um, the board members have a responsibility to address the in-person learning and vote. This is what you swore to uphold when you were voted in. Elementary and preschool children need to be in school to learn how to socialize and interact. These kids are behind in all areas. 
High schoolers will miss their friends and won't build those memories that we have all had in high school. I believe your director of research, Mr. Mike Moss, stated the other night that we shouldn't wait for one COVID death in our district to shut down schools. So I ask you, what will the district do when they have an online student commit suicide? Three years from now, some of you will look back and admit that you spent your entire year of life wearing a mask, cooped up in your house and avoiding all the people you love. I don't want that for my kids. One of our children is immune compromised. He has many health issues. We want him to live his life every day. Every single day is a risk. We should not be forcing our children to live like this. We went from being a free nation to being told that we couldn't do things like going to school. Yes, our health matters, but do you know what else matters? Family memories, getting to see friends, church, school, smiles, hugs, laughter. Don't waste the days you have. Your time here on earth matters. Live your life while you have the chance. And um, into uh, Mrs. Monica Martinez, you stated um, the word fear with what was voted on tonight. So I'll, I'll, I'll share that then. Stop living in fear. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. We have one final pub public comment regarding this line item. It's from Jerry Sharp. Hello. Um, I had absolutely no intention of coming up here, but um, I'm also a former educator in this school district and a former student, and I currently work as a chief officer in the fire service. One of the things I have the luxury of doing um, when I make strategic decisions, when I make um, risk managed de management decisions because of what's on the line and it's human equity. No politics get involved, no finances get involved, no, none of it. I get to cut the BS and it's a lovely position to be in in that moment. I think we need to focus on preventing death rather than COVID positives. I will say as we've commenced into this school year, I'm in complete agreement on how you guys have gone about it. As we've learned more, I just encourage you to add a couple more things to your metrics, which is the level of acuity, a signs of symptoms and what's going on, as well as the emotional, social well-being of our kids. I, do, I was not prepared, but the best of my understanding is suicides for youth in Arizona has tripled. It is going too far out and is purely attributed to the isolationism. I have also understand the level of acuity of signs and symptoms to be relatively minimal. Um, however, the suicides are not, we need to not focus so much when it comes to authentic risk management on positives as it is, we need to s focus on death. And it doesn't matter if it comes from COVID or suicide, it's irrelevant. And I encourage you to look at that rather than the politics and the posturing that's going on. Up to this moment, I'm in complete agreement. I will also say the three minute thing is interesting when one particular person got to grandstand for about 15 in favor of something. You need to be consistent. You need to be inequitable in all manners. Every voice needs to be recognized on all topics. Okay, authentic risk management, it's about saving lives. It's not about positives or anything else. If we need, to, we need metrics on the level of acuity. I find it alarming that positives are increasing as well. That is not a good thing. That is not a benign thing. That is not to be ignored. But we need to look at the secondary and the un unforeseen fallout, okay? And, and I am specifically about the emotional and social well-being of our kids to the greatest extent, which is suicide. And it's about life. It's not about COVID positives. And if the acuity is that low, and if they are indeed at the metric show, I will default to the statisticians, if they truly are that low, a COVID positive is a vaccine for a child. You now have the antibodies. If you went through a five, 10 day cold, you now, you theoretically, in my opinion, would not need a vaccine. I would never recommend we go for herd immunity concept, but that is a positive of having COVID. I would rather my children never have it. I'm not saying that but we need to look at saving life, not preventing positives. Preventing positives is great, but if there are unforeseen circumstances like suicide, I encourage you to look at that as part of your metrics because I know it is rising faster than child death. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for your time and your comments. Board members, comments, questions? 
I'll start. Sarah Martinez. Yeah, I can start. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, um, we have talked extensively, heard a lot about um, experiences. I want to start off with, uh, we've had a lot of questions about the accuracy of the data presented. Um, can you help me understand how confident you are and how you go about building that confidence on the numbers that are presented? Either you receive from the Maricopa County Health Services, how to make those decisions? Well, for, for me, uh, as a, a, a school superintendent and, and former teacher, uh, I have to rely on the, the uh, public health experts that are out there. And so we often talk with Maricopa County officials. We talk about the data. We talk about um, what is, what's happening within the data, uh, potential predictions that they have. When it comes to confidence in that data, I'm not qualified to, to determine that. Uh, but I, but we are, we, you know, we do frequently, again, um, work with, with those county officials and, and use that data currently to, to manage where we are. Thank you. Um, I know there has been a lot of question like, are you challenging the data? Um, you have sit on different round tables. Um, and then we talk about some of the other additional numbers. Uh, and we've learned a lot in that time. With the current benchmarks, are we considering adding a specific to PUSD benchmark? We talked about it a little bit about our study session. Um, yeah, yeah that is absolutely there. a possibility. That uh, you know, Mr. Moss talked earlier. Uh, we we do want to be careful about using the the data that we collect regarding positive cases in uh, our schools. Uh, that data is collected for the purpose of contract, contact tracing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it is not a, a total picture of uh, what is happening at that age group. I think that's why Mr. Moss chose to uh, also kind of overlay uh, what's happening in age groups across the county. Um, I started this uh, process because we didn't know what was going on uh, about COVID-19 and I was a proponent for virtual learning with my number one priority being safety but the back and forth that we heard uh, not knowing about the experience of Florida virtual that was reported that it was the best in the nation we've I've spoken to the students that was the other topic we talked about and unanimously our students say um, and there there's needs to be some work on that space, but the best place is in class. Uh, I also know that our K-3, when I look at state standards, I move on when ready. They need to be ready to read. I look at the data as reported. Um, and I'm concerned for my primary, starting there. With our, I've spoken before about most vulnerable students are special ed and our K-3 students. There's a lot of research that supports the importance of that uh, primary literacy, and, and we can go on and speak to that. But just to cut to the chase, um, I want to hear more what my board thinks, but I am leaning towards uh, focusing on our most vulnerable populations. Uh, I'm, I am confident and glad to hear using data and the numbers, I hear emails too that we're still open as a result of that decision. And we will be next week as well as we round up the semester. So I believe that con that decision um, put us in a position where we're all in person today. Going forward, uh, we've adapted our process on data analysis and I'm hopeful that the new board will use that same tactic. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm cons really concerned about the, the K-3, so. Thank you, Ms. Sam Martinez. Ms. Pingarelli? Oh, wait. pause? Okay. Ms. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all for coming and hanging in here for this epic meeting. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I do want to say that I understand sort of the premise behind the idea of a soft opening um, for the younger students that we have this you know thought that there's this assumption that most students are going to be exposed to an active case and the 10 day quarantine would help decrease the spread um, that families will be traveling with multiple contacts etc cetera, etc cetera, and that this two-week quarantine could potentially help wash out some of that 
um, and it would help us with staffing concerns, et cetera. Um, however, I have to say from my perspective as a mom of a student in the, stu in the district who fi frankly does fine on virtual or in person, um, as well as being the wife of a medical professional and an in-person teacher um, right now that I see significant drawbacks to that plan. Um, for one, um, it's not two weeks, it's actually four weeks of school that the kids will be out. And I can tell you that every week of school out causes learning loss. Um, online is not the same, and this will simply add to the months of already lost and incre increasing backslide of learning much more than normal break. Um, I would also say that considerable research indicates that the earlier quarantine and shutdown had significant impact on students and families' mental health, like many of you have already talked about tonight. Um, other research indicates that significant numbers of students had failing grades across the country, even at highly excelling schools, during the first quarter as compared to, uh, to the first quarter of 2019. And I can personally attest to that. Um, I started my job, I got my job a little bit late in September, and when I started, the students that I was appalled because I was at an A-rated, I am at an A-rated school, and I had more Ds and Fs than I've ever seen in my life. And many parents tell me that their students were typically A students, and this year, they've gone to Ds and Fs. Since we've returned to in-person learning, most of those students have regained that, but building that stamina has taken a lot of time. And frankly, the kids are, they're used to the new norms, they're used to the procedures, they're used to the masks. So um, you know, they're doing a good job. I would also say that you know, even the CDC has, has said, um, and you know, the folks out there have said that schools are the safest place to be. And that, the reason for that is because the support that we provide, but also because we have risen to the occasion and put the protocols in place to create a safe experience for our kids more than any other place in the community. We've taken that on, despite the challenges with budget and everything else. Um, I would also say that many students and families might consider this an extended winter break, and the idea of the quarantine will be lost anyway. So if we don't have students in school where they're wearing masks and using hand sanitizer and all that stuff, they could be out interacting in the community, which would just continue to prolong and expand the spread. I would also say <laughs> that other research indicates there is really no clear data on the impact and causality of in-person learning on community spread. Um, we don't. We can't pinpoint exactly where kids are getting it. Um, we know they're getting it. Um, and finally, I would say that you know, data in our own schools, although I'm a little concerned, I'm a little frustrated because we've been putting out data about positivity rates in our schools, and now we're saying that perhaps that data isn't legit, you know, legitimate. So that's a little bit of a concern for me. But according to that data that has been put out, it indicates to me that our, our procedures are working and, and I'm, I'm proud of our schools for being able to do that. Um, the other thing we know is that we do have a vaccine coming around the corner that is on the way. Um, and my biggest other concern about going virtual is that if we are to go virtual, what is our return plan? Because we took a very, very long time to get back to in-person learning in the beginning and we were looking at very low thresholds. And I know we all agreed on the benchmarks and we've learned a lot since then. And we've looked at different ways. We've also experienced a lot of the negative impacts. So I guess I just want to say, I'm sorry, way past my three minutes, <laughs> that again, as, from my perspective as a mom, as an in-person classroom teacher, someone who's married to a medical professional and who has elderly parents that are sig suffering from significant underlying conditions and who I'm trying to help relocate you know, and move and, and all kinds of things, I still believe that in-person learning is the best way for our kids. Um, I recognize the risks and I, I, we still have a virtual option and parents can exercise that, but I just, I personally believe that the way that we're doing things is, is the correct way, that our job is to educate students. Our job is not to tell the community to quarantine. Um, so I just think that we need to do the best that we can for the students in our care and we are providing those options. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Underhill. Uh, I just want to make a quick comment around public comment and, and really to you, Mr. Sharp. I, I, I apologize if anyone had felt that there was some level of inequity there. Um, you know, we, we were out of public comment at the time. The individual was a, a person who worked with the, the team to build the curriculum and was asked a question by a board member. However, that said, um, you know, maybe there's something that's something that we need to look at as a board. From a, yeah. Thank you. Ms. Stone? Woohoo! Um, I'd like to say uh, that a lot of the things that have been brought up tonight, I brought up a long time ago to this board. 
Um, I, I am against going back to full-time virtual. I am for the option of virtual for those who would like to have it. Um, it is a hardship on the students. It is a hardship on parents. And Ms. Hunterhill made some very telling remarks. Because, and I was just thinking that myself. These kids are not going to stay home. They're going to go out. They're going to be in their friends' houses. They're going to be wherever they want. They're going to go. And the, the parents, uh, most parents are back at work. And teenagers are, how many teenagers you know are going to just stay home oh, and do oh nothing? God. They're going, <laughs> going out, you know. He's unique. Um, also, the business about uh, the suicides, that was up early on. And, and I did talk about that. Um, it's, we don't have the accurate data data, whatever, um, as far as the death rates to COVID. We're not considering that because we're not, we're told we can't know that. We can't know about any of that. We can't know anybody that's in the hospital. We can't know any of that. So all we go on is these positives. And it's, you know, it's a very survivable pandemic, apparently. Um, I am not minimizing this, but that's just the truth. And I, I mentioned the other night that our the, the death rates in this country are stable. You want to know my personal opinion? I think a lot of the people that are dying right now are flu victims. I've had personal experience through plenty of friends of mine that were told they had COVID even though they had numerous negative responses. Hospitals are doing that and I don't know what to say about that. Um, our students need the in-person learning. I have seen such a change in my granddaughter since she was able to go to school and interact with her peers and she's going to physical therapy and interacting there, and it's just necessary. Um, I think that uh, there, and I, I had a bunch of the statistics last time I did this, and I don't have them. They were read to us anyway. Uh, many, as far as I can tell, almost all of the experts, definitely pediatricians and stuff, tell us it is much better for the kids to be in school. It is safer for them to be in school. We, we pride ourselves on our safety and our, our taking care of our kids. And I think we've done a good job. We've got all the hand washing stations. I had a little um, paper from my granddaughter's teacher today. Please post this in your home. We're teaching our pre-K how to wash their hands properly. You know, from the health organization. Please post this because we're teaching them. I, I believe that the cases probably go up I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not doubting that but I believe that the safest place even even health wise for our kids is in school and I believe that the only place they're going to get the education they need is in school so I want the option there for virtual for those that want it but I, I want us to be open for all grades if at all possible that's our job. Thank you, Ms. Dillon. Ms. Bingrelli? Well, thank you. Um, so looking at the data, it looks like we have the number of cases with the combination of students, staff, other staff, the total is less than 1% that's had COVID mm -hmm. in our, our district with, uh, with teachers. I'm looking at the 352. Not really a question if that's correct. <laughs> it is. I, I would just. I would just okay. say that. Yeah. You were looking at me puzzled. We, like okay. we are aware of. Okay. Yeah. We are aware of three. I believe whatever it is, three hundred and fifty-two okay. cases in our schools. Okay. I, I'm just getting it. It's it's less. It's less than one percent already that we've we've had. 
we're talking about shutting down schools with less than 1%. Uh, guys, I'm trying to speak. Thank you. I can speak for myself. Thank you. Um, uh, so with less than 1% uh, that have had COVID and are uh, with teachers and staff, and I'm, I'm like with the whole, the whole board, nobody's minimizing this. I mean, it's, 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 it's devastating when you get it. I mean, I'm sure everybody has known of somebody who's had it, somebody who's passed away from it, um, if not immediate, uh, friends. And so I'm not minimizing it, but um, I was looking at an email from one of our teachers and she was wanting to get back in school. She had said that 140 students at her school, sixth to eighth grade, uh, 103 had failed one class or were failing one class. Uh, several were failing numerous classes. Um, and so, I mean, we're losing a generation uh, with this. Um, at less than, less than 1%, uh, it's not worth it. Um, the safest place for the kids to be are in the, in the classroom mm -hmm. um, with their teacher. And do we know, I mean, I, I know that's gonna be the next topic is how do we get them back on track? How many students, or what is the percentage of students that are failing? And I, that is a question. Well, we are at the end of the semester, uh, and so we would have an accurate number for you uh, as we return from, return to second semester. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, I mean, for me, the safest place is in the classroom, and that's where I want the kids to start back as soon as Christmas break is over. Thank you, Ms. Pingarelli, and fellow board members, and again, thank you, community. You know, it's, uh, this isn't easy uh, because of the, um, <coughs> the fluidity of, of what's taken place, you know, since, uh, you know, since March, you know, as we entered this, this semester, you know, I, I believe, you know, as a board, um, you know, we voted 4-1 to, um, you know, take a very objective approach uh, to, um, as to when it was most safe, right, to open our schools, uh, which was following the data and the science. One thing that, you know, I always keep in mind is that as a district, um, you know, we're the fourth largest in our state, and our responsibility does, you know, go beyond, you know, our walls, meaning it also includes our 80,000 families. And you factor in the average family size, I mean, we're in upwards of, you know, 200,000 individuals um, that, um, you know, we, uh, we impact, you know, as we make decisions, you know, as a district, as a board, without question. Um, I believe that the district has done a fantastic job in, um, being very in intentional with its, its safety protocols, you know, from the mass to the, uh, you know, the social distancing and how we logistically, um, you know, set up our sites uh, to make sure that everybody was safe and then adding other uh, layers like, um, you know, the Clorox 360 uh, and the, the air purifiers that are, you know, on, on their way coming around the corner. Um, I think, you know, when we take a look at, you know, our, our site data, it is low without question. And I know there's some um, lack of reliability to, to some of those numbers, meaning that's just what we know of, right? Um, I mean, there have been some districts that have opened face-to-face um, -face and they've had to shut down. So a couple of things for me, um, you know, is the, individual has a son at sunrise um, the IEP you know if we take a look at and if we decide to you know open softly next semester I agree K3 uh, because we know so much more today right K3 you know absolutely needs to be face-to-face -face, um, our most vulnerable students students with special needs but the concern would be you know the ability to execute you know on behalf of you know, um, those students who, who are an IEP or who do have those special needs, right? Just hearing from, you know, the, the story that we heard this evening. Um, you know, we have a mantra that is every student every day. 
and um, you know we need to make sure that uh, you know given you know the, the the situation that we're in you know that we uh, make sure that uh, they're all successful so so there's that I think you know that's one question you know ensuring that we can absolutely um, educate with fidelity you know our students um, with special needs NIPs etc uh, even if you take a look at our McKinney Vento meaning homeless kids and foster students um, you know making sure that um, you know the, those students are also um, uh, cared for you know during this time I believe it's Mr. Under Underhills spoke to um, and, and maybe you didn't but uh, I you know this the blanketed approach I think um, is something that we need to um, take a look at as a board you know as we as we get back from a metric perspective yes we have the three benchmarks but how do we also include other measures like you know this the student data you know what, what you know what does that do right to, to help guide us um, I do believe that you know when we take a look at our zip codes you know some zip codes are high but some aren't right and uh, you know versus taking a all-inclusive approach um, you know I'd like to take a look at you know really taking a, a site by site approach right um, you know after we get back etc so when I talked about the measures and the protocols and the extra layers of safety I do believe by opening softly um, with the variables that I just spoke about right the k3 are most vulnerable that is yet another safety measure that will continue to, to mitigate the you know our, our sites from uh, any numbers increasing so um, that said you know I, I know you need some direction um, you know over the break um, and um, so I'm, I'm certainly open to discussion you know on you know what that looks like uh, if you know any board member wants to take a stab at uh, you know what some thoughts are based on comment based on you know we, we've had conversations with teachers staff mm -hmm. parents uh, students um, across the board so um, I believe from my standpoint I absolutely have taken a very informed approach uh, to be able to make an informed decision but uh, to say how you're it's like you're yes because um, you mentioned and and the reason why we bring up soft opening is because we have had the study session and we talked through that but we also recently received today or yesterday cdc update um they changed the quarantine time frame what is it to eight or seven days how many days i will refer us to our covid response team experts who deal with it every single day thank you uh, but they did reduce it Thank you for that question, President Sandoval. Uh, Mrs. Seha Martinez, to address that, they did issue an update. Maricopa County adopted it earlier this week, and so we implemented that change immediately from a 14-day quarantine to a 10-day quarantine. So it was reduced down. There is also uh, a portion of that that includes that after day six, a student may uh, go, that who's not exhibiting any symptoms, so who is asymptomatic, may go and get a test and then return on the eighth day uh, or after of their quarantine. So they may reduce that 10 day quarantine further if they are asymptomatic and uh, get a negative test. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the dialogue board and all those uh, comments and concerns. Uh, I, share, I share them as well. Um, there's no doubt in my mind K3 should return uh, immediately the question becomes those other subgroups uh, when I talked to the high school students some questions or concerns came up that goes on as to miss uh, Doan's point it's hard to keep them home my, my son is unique so I try to take myself off from that per personal bias uh, he loves to be in the garage but what I'm also learning that may be contributing to those high school students is because they're getting jobs and they're out as essential workers um, that may be a contributing factor and we can't control that uh, I think about our seniors scholarships um, it, and I am very proud of this district how we've mitigated that risk because that's why we're still open the question is can we level raise that level of concern uh, and heighten awareness to those protocols uh, and 
to, I believe I heard it earlier, the fear students have admitted, and I shared this with the parent roundtable, uh, that parents don't want to take their kids to get tested at all. That's concerning because there's that personal responsibility for well-being of others if we care about our neighbors. Treat those how you want to be treated or thou shall. Um, I am concerned about the suicide rate. The largest factor, the subgroup of the suicide rate is the LGBTQ community that we need to discuss. Uh, I am concerned. That is the worst thing, and I will say that again as a board member, when you get that call, it is the worst thing. Um, so as of now, our community and our schools have kept us in the green to the point we've finished the semester, and then red and then yellow. So I am hopeful, and we open up um, completely. So I'll, I'll stand with the board. That's what I heard. And that's what I heard from our parents and students. The, the, the personal responsibility, though, is huge. So. Yeah, without, without question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's, I mean, there's a lot of human lives involved, right? I mean, our teachers, our staff, uh, the community members, our primary target audience are our kids our students you know for me I just you know I don't want to um, risk the the opening up um, fully I mean again looking at a soft open but then going to a side-by-side -side basis um, because I don't want to have to close right um, at all and because everybody's correct our, our students are absolutely more successful uh, in the face-to-face -face environment uh, I would be our, our teachers, you know, have said they are more successful, you know, with, with our kids. But, um, you know, it's, you know, again, um, you know, I do view a soft opening as another layer of safety uh, for a couple of weeks, uh, you know, excluding uh, the, uh, the sectors that we just talked about, you know, K3 uh, and our most vulnerable. So, you know, I, I would be certainly in favor of that. But, you know, go ahead. I just thought and added another comment because we just – past LG, uh, the GCQC policy, which I would ask the new board uh, to meet sooner than later, because if we do, if we do move forward with 100% start, what impact that's going to have in our staffing model, um, in addition to in the next agenda item, which we'll all divulge in more detail what our current staffing situation is. So what I don't want also to happen is what happened to an, another neighboring district where we have to shut down schools as a result of lack of staffing because they decide to leave. So that's my ask is that the board meet more frequently in the new year. Does that help? Yeah, just on that note, um, I recognize that there was kind of an informal survey with the teachers and association and, and, and I recognize that. I also know that from that meeting that was held that there are a significant number of teachers also that are, are more afraid of what's going to happen if they don't come back then of getting the virus so i would say that there was information presented um on behalf of other teachers and teachers that i you know know and work with that um are ag agree with that so that's one thing um on the other another point um we talk about disruption and personally i feel like closing and going back to virtual is more disruption than continuing with the model that we're in and then like mr Sandoval, president sandoval is saying trying to figure out how do we evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, schools that really do have a significant outbreak that is concerning or that do have a st staffing issue. So I think that's another issue. But then um, also uh, to Ms. Seha, Martina's point, we actually we absolutely have to, as a community, support this because if our community doesn't support the mitigation strategies that we all need to do and support them broadly, we can't keep our schools open. So it's like up to all of us to keep our schools open. I think like other countries around the world have kind of made that priority and I think we need to follow suit. So. Thank you. So any other questions, motion. comments, Ms. Stone, Ms. Fingerelli? No. So do you need a motion? I need some direction, yes, please. I, yeah, oh, you're go gonna... ahead and I think, um, I yeah, I think, you know, for me again, um, like I said, it's, it, it's yeah, another informed layer of safety. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I, I do feel that um, it is smart, it is existential, it is, um, you know, considering all the lives that we're responsible for, um, that we, you know, I move that we do open softly, uh, minus the uh, K-3, or most wonderful students, special ed kids, et cetera, um, for a couple weeks, uh, and then get back so we stay open. But I want to come back in a way that you know we review the data that includes some other other data sets that we make decisions on a site by site basis versus you know overall the district. I don't need to be rude, but K three are not committing to suicide. Five hundred and twenty two I'm sorry. Uh, 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 yeah. Order. Yeah. Order. Yeah. Thank you for that. President Sandoval, well, was that was that a motion? That was a motion, yes. That was a motion. Okay. President Sandoval, may I ask for clarity on the wording of the motion, please? Sure, it would be to open softly next semester, excluding K. Hmm. Well, that's a good point. What? Um, well, let me ask you this: What? Um, you know, if we expanded it to uh, take a look at, you know, based on that data set, right? Because we want to be informed. You know, you know, a K through you know five model. Does that? Ages five I'm sorry, yeah. President yeah. Sandoval. Yeah. 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 You know what? And I and I apologize. Point of I'm order, out of order, please. Point I'm out of order. order. So tell you what, Miss Contra, my motion is this. Um, you know, I move that we open schools softly in the next semester, excluding K three special ed students most vulnerable uh, McKinney Vento homeless kids um, and can reconvene early January to take a look at the data and um, start considering how we make decisions on a site-by-site -site basis versus a blanketed decision across the district. Let me make sure I understand that correctly. Motion to open softly the second semester to include K-3. And I'm sorry, I lost. To exclude K-3. So K-3 would be face-to-face. -face. So we'd open softly. So 4 through 12 would be virtual. K-3 would be face-to-face. -face. And we would be open for on-site support for anyone who needed it. Ma'am. Ma Motion to open in person for K through three. President Sandoval, you want? What's that? We, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Do you want me to give it, give it a shot? Okay. Because I've, I've, I've just jotted down a few things, um, and I think it might provide some clarity if that, sure. if that okay. helps. So um, a motion to open on January 4th uh, with pre-K through three and critical need students returning to in-person learning. Grades, I think what I heard you say, four through 12, return to virtual learning for a period of two weeks. Correct. Is that what I said? And then we just have to add one more piece that I think I heard you say, and that is, tell me when you're ready, right. to readdress the reopening benchmarks upon return to second semester. Does that capture your right with a focus on making side by side decisions versus and you we can readdress those once we get there okay that Pre covers it President Sandoval yes, um, I would like to make a substitute motion Miss Harry uh, substitute motions are voted on first I'm just would you just just letting Miss Contra catch up so this is a substitute motion. Now, do we actually need a second first before? I believe so. We need a second 
okay. first, and then we can do a substitute okay. motion. Okay. So just need a second on my motion, if any. I was going to make a motion if the if your motion failed. Mm -hmm. It did. Okay. I motion to open up the schools fully uh, in Peoria on January fourth. I'll second. Can I make an um, amend that motion? Just just a little tweak. <laughs> do we have to vote on that or? How do, I believe we have a we have a. A motion and a second on the floor and it, it needs to be voted on first okay then that's fine i'll I let think the new board so yeah yeah hmm? yeah just for clarification when you say fully can you clarify what that means, that's please? what it, that's what um i get it for any of the the parents that are sending their their students right now to online and they want to stay online um, they have that opportunity everybody else that is in school now that wants to continue to come back after the, the Christmas holiday, um, that they have the opportunity uh, to do so from pre-K through 12th grade. Perfect. I just wanna clarify, and that would be with the protocols and procedures that are in place currently? In terms of the hand washing and yeah, we're not changing that. This one is just opening of schools. But. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I take a swing at it? He wants to tweak it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to. We we just want to try to maybe condense that. And again, I would just give some. So uh, the motion might be to open in our current learning modes, uh, regardless of the benchmark data that is correct that does both things for for us Perfect. does that sound is it i just want to make sure all right does that capture mm -hmm. miss contra are you good just to clarify, motion to reopen fully in our current learning mode, regardless of the benchmark data, on January 4th for pre-K through 12th grade. And I would just say modes, plural. If that's, does that yeah, help us clarify? Yep, as long as parents know that they have the option to keep their, their, their kids at home and they can do online learning. So, yeah. I believe we, we cabinet, do we understand what the, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Tori. I just have one more question around that fourth data point that we've been talking about. Do we need to include that in this motion or is that, no, okay, all right, thank you. Not, not at this moment. What I might recommend is if that's something we wanna consider, we can, we can reconvene in January and talk about that. Okay. All right, everybody good? Just did you have another? Go no, ahead. I don't have any amendments. I just discussion. Is that what you're going to open it up for? Uh, no, uh, we have a motion and we have a second. And I think Ms. Scott, oh. go ahead. And I, and I just want to, if it's okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I need to be so, um, Ms. Underhill. I just wanted to, to point out that the reason why I say that is because if in fact uh, there were something like that in the meantime, uh, the 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 Maricopa County, Maricopa County has uh, works with us to to make that decision, and and we've all that would be a normal process outside of this. Perfect. Now we can have discussion, right, on the motion, because we have a first and a second. Is I think we've been discussing. Sure, it. We can't. I thought I thought we did. Perfect. Oh, uh, so I was just going to add. Whoop, too close. Um, the the protocols. Just r the protocols. How we have it. If the quarantine. If the kids come back and they get t and and they're tested, they would do fill still follow the eight the new eight day or six day or whatever day you emailed us. Yeah, Is that we, correct? we okay. I heard we are still under using same our protocol current mitigation strategies. Okay. And then my only ask was that the new board that first week 
talk through or whenever the meeting is that's that fourth data point that we've heard a lot from our community about so that's it yep. very good miss contra we have a motion by miss pingarelli and a second by miss stone board members please cast your votes Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, board members. All right. No worries. We still uh, have one more agenda item. Yeah, we have, oh yeah, that's right, sorry, 12.5. Approval of compensation increases for substitute teaching. Dr. Carter Davidson. All right, uh, again, good evening, President Sandoval, members of the board, Superintendent Reynolds. This uh, agenda item is one that I bring to you tonight um, for a variety of reasons. Um, number one, we wanna ensure that we can fill the open classrooms with qualified substitute teachers, first and foremost, to provide that education that we've all talked about tonight. Number two, uh, I want to be competitive in the marketplace. Um, numerous districts right now around us are looking at the compensation model for their guest teachers based on the fact that we are teaching in, in a pandemic. So I bring to you tonight um, an agenda, a recommended action even, that details out what I was hoping for. Uh, and there's two things. Um, number one, um, increasing compensation for our current substitute pool right now and you see in the uh, agenda and the, the information included we are typically near or at 70 percent fill rate uh, so what that means is our campuses and our principals our teachers are covering classes our principals are serving as um, substitute teachers at times and we would like to increase our fill rate so my hope would be for a period of time that we look at compensation um, second the second thing we are doing is looking at an emergency substitute certificate for our current employees um, who are serving in our classified ranks and so what i'd like to do is uh, alongside our principals work with them to give them an opportunity to help in a different way again providing quality support in the classrooms but also have a chance to earn additional compensation that they wouldn't otherwise earn right now we have 22 of those individuals across our schools that have stepped up and said we, we want to use our skills to serve as teachers. Um, on a side note, I would view that as a possible pipeline for us as we grow our own teachers in the future. So that's why I'm here tonight and would uh, stand for any questions. Thank you, sir. Questions, comments, board members? Uh, Ms. Stone? I don't see any need to quibble. Let's do it. Thank you for that. Ms. Underhill? Yeah, I agree. I think it's completely acceptable and appropriate, and let's do it. Ms. Pingarelli? Yep. Ms. Sam Martinez. I do have a couple questions. Uh, how much, are, uh, what's the ask, uh, the financial ask? Because if we're increasing pay, is that what, what the ask is? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Sam right Martinez. Um, I was we looking would, for the fine print. Well, what I did on the classified individuals, we using the minimum wage, because some of our jobs are that, if we increased uh, at least $5 per hour for each classified individual serving in that role, if they were to serve a full day in that capacity, they would be at that um, range of um, 135. So I'm um, trying to make certain that balanced out. Um, and you see the, the variation in pay uh, be anywhere from $30 to $20, depending upon the role that substitute teacher served. How does that compare to our neighboring districts? Um, watching what happened in, in, in a nearby district recently and knowing some others, we will be right, uh, right in the mix. Okay. 
Uh, I'm gonna bring up, I received some phone calls um, in regards to staffing. What is the, you mentioned 70% of fill rate. What, what is the worst case scenario we've experienced of, t of staff members calling out or you know using their, their time and then we're needing subs and then unfilled rates? So what's the worst case scenario we experienced? Um, as, of, as of the last two weeks, I, I pulled just the last two weeks data. We had uh, our largest amount out was 154 teachers. And at that time, we had only 93 substitute teachers. So that put us at a 60% fill rate. Um, and I, that is less than ideal, certainly. Um, what I know, too, is that the fill rate, that's the number I'm giving you as a whole, it varies across campuses. Um, at any given time, uh, a campus could, in some cases, have zero fills. And that uh, puts a great strain on our campuses. So uh, anything that uh, the board would approve tonight would certainly help us uh, hopefully change that. And, and, and again, I would love to come back with a data set that says with uh, this opportunity, our fill rate has increased. So I'll certainly be able to report that back to you once we get it moving. I um, thank you for sharing that just because I've lived this experience when we don't have a substitute, the classes get split. And we just talked about mitigating risk and reducing COVID-like symptoms, COVID symptoms. And so essentially what we're doing is putting a class of 35 and splitting it up to two classes. And now you got 35, anywhere from 40, 50. Um, so I'm really concerned. I also think that this is another priority for the board uh, to convene with the administration. If this number is not sufficient, really consider another amount sooner than later so we don't experience shut downing, shutting down whole schools. We already experienced that a few years ago at the district level. Um, we need our kids in school. We need to mitigate risk. And this is an investment to do both of those things. Uh, so you have my support, but I'm asking the new board and administration to really consider and watch those numbers mm -hmm. for a potential higher increase in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. I do need a motion to approve 12.5, approval of compensation increases for substitute teaching. I will so move. I'll second. Ms. Contra, we have a motion by Ms. Doan and a second by Ms. Seja Martinez. Board members, please cast your votes. Motion passes 5 0. Thank, Thank you, board you. members. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. Moving on to our informational reports, section 14. All these reports are on our website 14.1 budget facilities planning and construction report, 14.2 district budget report for the month of October 2020, district enrollment reports for the month of October 2020. Again, all these are on our website for viewing at your convenience. Report on up upcoming meetings and events. Uh, Ms. Airy, anything to call out? None this evening, President Sandoval. All right, thank you. All right, moving on to 14.5, legislative state and local updates. Ms. Myers. Thank you, President Sandoval. Members of the governing board, I don't have an update this evening. All right, other business, 15.1, board member opportunity to readdress agenda items. Ms. Stone? No, thank you. Okay. Ms. Underhill? Ms. Sam Martinez? Oh. No, my last one, no. <laughs> I, I, I do have something I wanna say, sure. though. I want to thank Ms. Kim. Oh, yes. She is the heart and soul of this place and the governing board couldn't run without her <laughs> thank you so much thank you Ms. Stone um, moving on to 15.2 request for agenda items for future governing board meetings Ms. Stone um, you still can I do I, I, I want um, I do. I want some kind of study done on the on the effectiveness of the masks and stuff, and and presented and just 
figure out that protocol and what's going on there, please. It's giving me heart palpitations right now. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Okay, do you need it? Okay. It's a second by Miss Sam Martinez, uh, Miss Contra. You good? Ms. Anahel? Um, yeah, I guess I would just say that it's probably going to happen sooner than later. I don't know, but uh, some kind of a, a discussion around uh, the school, school rates and evaluating spread case by case on a case by case basis. I'll second that. Is that related to the fourth data point that you're talking about? Okay. Yeah. So that being recommendation, recommendations to the district to bring forth other data sets um, that will help guide us in making site by site decisions, something like that. Okay. Did you get that, Ms. Contra? Yes, sir. Thank you. You got it. Ms. Ping, really? All right. Ms. Ann Martinez? I will let the new board decide. <laughs> so, no. Perfect. I don't have any items at this point. Um, with that said, we will move on to 16.1 adjournment. I do need a motion to adjourn this meeting. Oh, I get to do that. And I will second. All I right. <clears throat> move that we adjourn this meeting. Final motion from Ms. Stone to adjourn in the final second. I second. By Ms. Sarah Martinez. Board members, please cast your votes. It says, says on, on tonight's presentation. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, everybody. Cabinet, thank you. Dr. Reynolds, Ms. Stone, uh, Ms. Underhill, Ms. Fingerelli, Ms. Ampertinus, thank you.